so welcome back. We are just coming back from our executive session, uh, and we are re-entering public session at 1040. At this time, we are ready to move into reports, and we will start out um, with the superintendent's report. So okay. I think it should come up on that screen over there. Do, I, do you know how to do this? Because... Oh, I can advance the slides, but they have to put oh, it on the screen. Okay. Just, yeah, I technically. Advance, I just don't know how to make it. Yeah. Um, oh, there we go. Oh, yes. So, um, I'm sorry. I did move over public comment. Are there people here from the public who would like to speak? Anybody? Okay. So, seeing none, we will um, move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will be quick, except for enrollment. All right, so what you see on that screen right now is the enrollment numbers from August 12th. Uh, and if you look down at the bottom of the approved column, you can see that we were then at 169 new students since June. What has happened since Monday is we have had 22 students enroll in the Hopkinton Public Schools in the last three days. So I did bring copies for you because that was already cast in stone by the time these numbers came off the press this morning. If you are out there in the audience and you'd like a copy of this document, it's pretty wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, here's some extra copies. So some of the, the highlighted areas, you can see that now grades 7, 9, and 11 are at 305, 315, and 322, respectively. Uh, grade 5 is a little bit of a concern for me. There are 280 students there in 12 classrooms. Um, and so the fear is that when we get to our next fifth grader, we're going to have our first classroom of 25 in that building. Uh, we're, there. we're apparently there. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, those are our high numbers. And um, at this point in time, it's very difficult to be able to add a classroom because we're not just adding a physical classroom and putting a teacher in it, but we also have to think about how we would educate those kids in PE wellness, in art, in music, and then you're hiring .05 of a wellness teacher, .05 of a PE teacher, .05 of an art teacher. Um, so it's not unlikely that when we are before you um, in September, or maybe there will even have to be a meeting before that, um, we will probably be looking for a Paris to support the teachers in classrooms during guided reading times and things like that. Dr. Cabanel, um, given that the prediction was better this year from NESTEC, um, or they went through a more rigorous process and they had given a projection of 104 students? Yes, about that, yep. And we are at 191 before school starts. And I'm wondering, uh, do you uh, recall or do you have that information handy? What were the numbers like around last year this time and how many were added during the school year? So I'm, I'm just trying to understand how much should we be prepared for through the year? I don't right, remember. Through the school year. It, right. And I'm not sure if I remember exactly where we were at this point in time last year, but by October we had hit 186. So we are exceeding last year's numbers right now. This is a concern. It is indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I guess from last time when we all met and we looked at the numbers and I think we had raised concerns about ninth grade. And at that time you had felt that, yes, the numbers are, you know, where they are, but you know, we are prepared for this. And to me, at this point, from last month to this month, I don't know with, especially with 25 students at Hopkins, um, the classroom size is increasing. Um, I, I think we need to raise a big red flag here. And, uh, you know, I know there's a capacity study and whatnot coming up, but I wonder how, um, how we are going to prepare for all of this. So maybe my next slide will be helpful. And, and I think we had talked about this last time, and one of the things that I had said is 
you know, it's not easy, but it's relatively quick in terms of time to put teachers in front of kids because you advertise for a position, you go through the hiring process, you find a second grade teacher, a seventh grade math teacher, an A para, you can put the bodies in there. I think the greater concern is where we're going to put all of these bodies, right? Because we continue to get student after student and our physical plants are only so big. They can only accommodate so many human beings, right? Even as tiny as some of them are, we can only accommodate so many students. Um, so I think when we take a look at the next slide, maybe this will be helpful. Uh, we are anticipating opening the White House. It should be habitable for our 18 to 22 kids. It will not be completely furnished probably on the opening day of school, but um, it will certainly have all of the, the walls, the floors, the lighting, and, and that stuff in there. Um, the things that would require you know educational things like tables and chairs and desks, those will be in there. The kitchen should be up and running. Um, so it will be pretty well furnished, if not but probably not entirely. Uh, right now we have architects that are producing cost estimates for us for an additional six classrooms at the high school. Um, the, we got very good news from the Mass School Building Authority. They will be coming to the Elmwood School on September 17th and they will be looking to see if the overcrowding that we allege is happening in the Hopkinton Public Schools is real. <laughs> we can assure them it is. Uh, there is uh, a capacity study underway. We've put out the RFP for that. And um, I know that we've had conversations with some of the school committee members about trying to accelerate that process. And we'll, we'll try to make that happen. And then the director of finance and the director of building and grounds are exploring costs for like modular classrooms if we have to do that. So these are all of the things that we have going on right now. They are all in the works. but. You know, anything like this does in fact take time. So while I say we can put teachers in classrooms, we can. We just need to have the classrooms to put the teachers and the students in. And that's what I think this work is about. This is the more alarming work. Can I just have one oh, question on the sorry. previous slide? Ahead, oh, yes. Yep, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, is there a chance that in fifth grade we'll be adding a new uh, main teacher with a new classroom so that uh, students after September 1 will have to transition from a lead teacher? To another lead teacher, as we had some of that friction last year with the middle school with the unexpected growth. We did. I know it was very unsettling for the students, and these are even younger kids. And Vanessa and I, Mrs. Bellello and I, had these conversations yesterday at the end of our two-day retreat. So I don't know if you want to speak to that sure. because it's really your building, and a lot of this is your decision making. You already spoke to the challenges in terms of our um, related arts classes. So philosophically, I have a lot of concerns about just taking all of our new students and opening up another classroom. We are at the point, the building was really built for 24 external classrooms. In an elementary model where you spend most of your day in one classroom, it would mean that we would have students in a room without windows all day if we had a 25th classroom, which I have a lot of concerns about um, for students. Um, and so then we would be displacing a program, multiple programs, in order to do so. So the combination of adding related arts, um, that would require us to completely blow up our schedule too. If we go at this point in the year, contractually the teachers are supposed to have their schedules. Yeah, so oh, would you mind just going up there? Sure. Because we're sure people at home would like to hear what you're saying. Sure. <laughs> so Hopkins physical building was really built for 24 classrooms. That was the size that it was built for as far as classroom spaces, which is what we're at, 12 and 12 sections. So if we are to move to a 25th section, my first concern is it means it's an internal classroom. And at the elementary level where you spend the majority of your day with a homeroom teacher, it would mean those students would be in a classroom without windows for a, a lot of their day. Um, Dr. Cavanaugh spoke about the challenges in terms of related arts. That, in addition to the hiring of those staff, would require an entire blow up of our schedule. Contractually, um, the HTA has an expectation that we give teachers a schedule, and we have worked days and hours and hours on building not only a master schedule with the 24 sections, but in addition to that, the teachers have crafted schedules to address 
English as a second language and special education needs. So adding a 25th classroom at the elementary level have, is very different than at a secondary middle school level. So I do not anticipate that as being an, a, an, a solution. So that does mean since we've gone to 25 in a classroom already at fifth grade today, most likely what we would look at is adding <laughs> paraprofessional supports so we can address our needs in reading and math. And that. How um, physically, a classrooms, I haven't been in Hopkins in a while, so um, how tight is it? I mean, if we add, I mean, heaven forbid, 10 more fifth graders, you mm -hmm. know, so right now sprinkling two or three kids across the, you know, the teams or one or two, are we getting physically tight in the existing classrooms and then we're adding paras on top of that? Yeah. So 23 um, to 24 feels tight at fifth grade, especially yeah. in the spring. Um, <laughs> Dr. Devlin had a, a fifth grader and I, you were in there and you could see that um, yep. space was. You to negotiate around them. Yes. The <laughs> one good news in terms of furniture, there has been a large movement to more flexible classroom spaces. And so you do see a lot of classrooms where you don't necessarily have 24 desks or 25 desks. Yeah. That mm -hmm. has helped as far as furniture needs. As teachers have explored different ways and models and knowing students need to get up and move and be on the floor, mm -hmm. there's a lot of that going on at Hopkins. So that helps with furniture needs. Um, so it, it will be tight. Mm -hmm. It will definitely be tight. But it is, in my opinion, better for the children um, to go bigger in size and add more adults to support those classrooms than to try and figure out how to make a, a 25th classroom work at this point. Any other questions? So I'm sure you already considered adding a modular classroom and that struck you as not Well, being I mean, that was not something that came up last year and as has been a problem going back in time because of when we do our um, looking at a budget, the timeline, our numbers are, you know, a little different. I can say that two years ago, you were asking about the over-the-year enrollment. Our fourth grade had 45 new students, I think, added, and half of that was over the summer and half was during the school year. That was two years ago. So I, I do, I, I've told teachers to anticipate being at 25 or 26 based on where we're at. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for all those considerations. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, I, I love the Hopkins team structure. I, I love how you run the school. So Thank you. if we can keep it if, it, if it still works, great. I'm very worried. I, I mean, knowing space. what, um, with, what um, Mrs. Carver has at, at third grade right now, we're right. already exploring how to make that work and, and figure out the best way for kids. Yes, I think our biggest concern at Hopkins was looking at the current third grade size. Yes. So next year you'll be in a very different place, I for think. For sure. Mm -hmm. It looks like that third grade could hit 300 easily by next year. Yes. yes. And I definitely back you up on the idea of keeping kids in classrooms that have windows yes. and keeping yes. kids in spaces that are comfortable and right. more enhance their learning versus make them feel they're living in a cave. So I, know. I appreciate that. I totally back you up you. on that. Thanks. I agree. I can't imagine kids being in a classroom with no windows all day. It's a little different at the high school level where you might go to a bio lab for a for period now, right. versus <laughs> you living absolutely. all day in a room or for yeah. a teacher for that matter right. to spend all day yeah. and that is challenging. But there are uh, rooms within the school. Nancy, kids. just a small request. Are you able to bend the screen of the laptop so I can see the... Oh. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, no. I'm, 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 I'm Miss Brown. Um, Hello, Mr. how are you? But there are rooms within Hopkins that students use throughout the day that don't have windows. Correct. So um, the internal classrooms, one of them services um, and houses um, a learning center, which is used flexibly and, in, and has a lot of different uses, but students come in and out flexibly. So they might go in there for part of the time. Another room houses an adjustment counselor. Another room houses a guidance counselor. Those rooms are not full classroom size. So as far as full size classrooms that could be changed in terms of internal space. One um, was converted to the science lab several years ago with a grant from um, the, um, is it friend? The trustees. Trustees, yeah. the school trustees. So a lot of thousands of dollars was put to make that a science lab space. 
Another space is shared between math tutors, our literacy support, and our specialized um, reading support for students who get substantial it would be specialized programs in reading, for example, Wilson, um, Orton Gillingham programs where the students could benefit from a quieter space. Yeah. So one room is utilized by four staff members for small group instruction. Okay. Um, the other one is the science lab and the third one is our special education learning center. So all of those are housing throughout a day. Ms. Babson, I mean, the numbers of students that use those three classrooms is significant. Mm -hmm and staff members, quite a few. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. That's, well, that's all right. I think our, our big winner, though, might be third grade. <laughs> They've had five new kids this week alone in three days. So we've got. Someone was enrolling as I left. OK. <laughs> all right, moving right along. All right, this is just a, a little snippet from the letter that we got from the MSBA. Uh, it just lets us know that when they do their senior study, they'll be examining applicable enrollment program and or facility issues as identified within the statement of interest. Um, so that's why they're coming out here on the 17th, and it will be very interesting to see what they see when they do. Uh, we have here the draft of the strategic objectives for 1920. Uh, the administrative team was just together for the last two days. We revamped um, some of the vision, mission, and values. We have rationales for um, enrollment growth, individual pathways, and um, communities of collaboration. And then what we've done is we've taken that strategic objective document that we put together um, in the last year with our consultant, Cindy Bonney, and uh, we have put into that document all of the actions that the buildings and principals and director of technology, assistant superintendent, business manager, HR will be undertaking in this current year. And I know that that's very difficult for you to read from far away but I did email you a copy of that. So it actually fits into you know, sort of that graphic as you had seen it. And then the last thing to share with you with these bright and shiny faces of your administrative team uh, from yesterday, you can see that we are prepared and excited for school to start. And we're all wearing our Learn, Create, Achieve Together t-shirts. So we mean business. Do the colors have a significance? Those are the teams. Yeah. Oh. Ah. And I, I do think at the end of the day, if I counted up the, uh, the points correctly, the yellow team did rain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the gold team, that's right, I'm sorry. <laughs> the gold team did not want to be called the yellow. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, for the update. And um, best wishes to you and your entire administrative team for the start of the school year. Thank you. All right, then that brings us into Report B, which is the bus, lot, bus parking lot update. Um, so just quickly, the, the bus lot is um, very close to completion. They should be putting on the final top coat and striping uh, should be completed by the 23rd and at which time then we will start to move to bring the buses over. Um, we've had discussions in terms of the path that the students will take. We've had discussions in terms of the paths that the uh, parent, um, parents will take in the mornings and in the afternoon. Um, and the students both getting on and off the bus and the students that are driving as well. Um, in addition, from the bus parking lot, we broke through, which was not part of the scope, uh, but we broke through from the parking lot to the path that students use to walk down to the parking lots. So there's a nice transition from the bus lot to the walking path in, in addition. So uh, the contractor was um, excellent, and, and that type of 
over and above, like I said, was not part of the scope, but very willing to, to do those things for us. Is that the gravel between the middle school and high school? Yes. That's, I saw that. It looks nice. Yeah. Okay. okay. Could you just comment um, for the viewing audience when um, communication will come out, uh, do you think, about um, traffic patterns and whatnot? I believe probably over the next week. Yes, one officer Prow was, was here. We talked about having a meeting early next week to make sure everyone's on the same page. We did get in touch with Bill from World Tech, and he's the engineer who did the traffic patterns for us last year. So okay. we hope we have a workable plan. <laughs> <laughs> We're not traffic engineers, so we rely on our but help. he is. Yes, but he is. All right. That's great. Then uh, at this point, I will say that I have approved the payroll warrants S20002, S2002A, and S20003. The payroll warrants have been included in your packet. And I've also approved warrants 20-003, 20-004, 20-005, 20-006, 20-007, 20-008, 20-009, 20-010, 20-011, 20-012, 20-013, 20-014, 20-015, 20-016, 20-017, 20-018, 20-019, 20-020, 20-021, 20-022, 
perhaps mid to late September. We had also considered doing office hours at the spoon in September. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something for us to look out for and figure out which of the two we do in September. Are there liaison reports that people want to share this time? No, the only thing we've worked on is policy, and that's later on in the meeting. So I feel like lots of policy. To get there. Yeah, lots of policy. So I had just two quick uh, CPAC had an ice cream social uh, a week or so ago, almost two weeks, I guess. And then the Turf Field Oversight Committee did meet again, uh, working on uh, revenue reports and some policies of, regarding use. So we will meet again in September, and I will. Perhaps have something more at that point. Uh, that brings us to new business. Uh, the first item of new business is a CPAC gift account. And Dr. Zaleski, would you like to come up and discuss? Hello. Hello. So I've been working with um, CPAC, the board, over the summer. Uh, Chelsea Rockold and Robin Malone are here tonight, uh, today. And we had a wonderful opportunity to partner and really talk about the needs moving forward um, to have a successful CPAC and to function as a board. And one of the items that came up in our discussion was the need for a CPAC gift account. And what the gift account would allow uh, CPAC to do is to be able to fundraise or take any d money that might be donated, um, whether it's from the community or from you know other accounts, and have a place to put the funds. But right now, we, we're in a little bit of a quandary because we don't have a place to put uh, any funds that might be uh, either fundraised or donated. So um, in order to keep everything on the up and up, we really want to have a CPAC gift account for that purpose. And, um, and then, you know, then at that point, once we have funds in the account, CPAC would make some determinations as to how to use those funds, whether it's to have guest speakers, set up workshops, um, provide things like the ice cream social. Um, friends of CPAC donated funds to our ice cream social, so we're very thrilled and grateful for that. It was, I, in my opinion, a successful event, and families were able to come out and have ice cream and socialize and participate in some events. So, um, so that is the request, that we have a CPAC gift account approved for that purpose. And I don't know if CPAC has anything else they would like to add. Please. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you guys come up here to see yeah, your Yeah, why don't you come up so yeah. people can see. The audio can be shared at home that way. I will, I will add from, yourself. from um, my perspective, this is pretty typical of how accounts are set up for CPAC. Okay. It oh, is cool. very typical for it to be part of a revolving gift account. Um, the nice thing about that is then it adds to the transparency because those yeah. warrants and the requests and the decisions that the board make come through the warrant process so the school committee is um, seeing and approving um, because CPAC is required uh, for school committee to, mm -hmm. to have this basically shows you're um, working with the board and having that transparency of those funds. So it is a very typical setup in most districts. Okay. okay. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robin Malone. I'm the secretary of the CPAC. And I am Chelsea Rackhold, liaison. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. Sounds like this is long overdue. So I'm going to make that motion to uh, approve the creation of a CPAC gift account. Second it. All right, so we will do a roll call um, since we have me and Harold. I'll start down with you, Amanda, if that's okay. Aye. Aye. Mina? Aye. Yes. And I am also a yes. Did you guys want to talk a little bit at all about anything about your CPAC related since we have you here? Uh, the only thing I would like to say um, is thank you for having us. Um, and uh, we are looking forward to working collaboratively um, to really enhance the community aspect of the CPAC. Great. That's Fantastic. great. Thank you. So, to have you. one thing that we did with CPAC, I think, was it your first year, two years ago, uh, was that we had the entire school committee came to a CPAC meeting, which I thought was a good... Yeah. We yes, did. we would absolutely good. love to invite everybody to our Down. first CPAC meeting, which I believe is September 17th. It's an introduction um, and welcome to CPAC. And then we're having a basic rights workshop that's going to be really, really a good one. We're actually having our 
um, school district attorney Paige Tobin um, presented. That's October 23rd. 23rd, thank you. Um, and that's going to be really good. And we're actually hoping also to have a um, representative from the Needham CPAC come and have a little um, discussion afterwards, too. And she's a really great parent that I think can give us a lot of um, really wonderful insight to how their CPAC is, is working. And I think that's going to be great, too. So yeah, we would love to have all of you to come to our CPAC meetings. We're trying to get everybody involved. We're really hoping that this is going to be a great year and get a lot of um, a lot of parents coming and uh, sort of get the um, get the community um, together and and make it. You know, we're, our our goal is to create a wonderful um, space for our children to have some more inclusion in the community. Okay, that's great. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much for all the work that you do, and I hope your gift account is filled with lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Well, thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you. Enjoy the last right. bit of summer. Yes, yes. thank you. Yes. You too. You're welcome to stay if you want. To. Right, I think yeah. we, might, we, we might be... Welcome yeah. to stay right <laughs> at the end. <laughs> <laughs> right at the end. Get comfortable. Uh, so then why don't we go ahead right into... Um, the next item, which is JKA policy revision uh, regarding physical restraint. Um, is that I, Nancy, are we going to skip over the Elmwood School gift account B? Or so or we're going to do it out of order. Is that totally okay fine. if we do that order out know. of order just okay. because they're? Yeah, I just didn't. There's, didn't sorry. know if you skipped it or did it on purpose. Okay. Thank it you. Was an accidental on purpose. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I think it does make sense. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just so folks understand and those who are watching, JKAA is uh, the physical restraint and seclusion policy. The reason that we're sitting here today is, um, I don't know if you folks recall, but last year we underwent a, a tiered focus monitoring review from the Department of Education. And throughout the process of that review, we uh, did very well. But the one area that we were cited on by the Department of Education was in the area of physical restraint. And uh, what we were cited on was for missing key regulatory information in our policy. So I worked diligently with Ms. Parson, our assistant superintendent, and the superintendent to look at our existing policy and, and then to see what key pieces were missing. And then I was invited to attend the policy committee with Ms. Fagiano and Ms. Devlin, as well as the superintendent and assistant superintendent to um, have some further discussion about those revisions that needed to be made. And really what we did was we look at, looked at the Mass General Law and we looked at the Department of Education regulations. And we went back and forth just in terms of language change and what made sense in terms of readability for the community. And um, so we came up with the policy that you have before you, which is really not negotiable in terms of the regulatory requirement um, because we were cited. So, just for, as a matter of clarity for the community, this policy is not changing our practice right now. It's just regulatory language change and information change that is required to be in the policy. That being said, there is a related procedure that's part of the policy that um, the only thing we changed this summer was in terms of the order of the procedure. And we embedded some additional definition, definitions and information that were required to be in there. Um, but again, we did not change anything in term, from a practice place in the procedure. What I would like to do, um, if in fact this policy is approved today, um, well, two things I have to do. I have to report it to the Department of Education this afternoon as to the outcome of today's meeting. But the second thing I would like to do is work with the CPAC board in terms of examining our procedure, because that is a fluid process, and we can always look at refining our practices. Um, so that's kind of the order of things um, in terms of moving forward with this. The second piece that I have to do besides reporting this afternoon to the Department of Education is um, all staff need to be trained on this voted upon policy, if in fact it's voted upon. And um, they have to be updated as to what the regulatory requirements are. And um, and then it needs to be posted for parents to see. That's another part of the requirement. The parents need to see the regulation change. So we'll post that on the district website, the, the change policy. We'll probably do that right away. So my request is to approve the policy. But I will tell you, just in brief, um, what the key changes are, if you don't mind. Great. So prone restraint is an add-on. We had information in there, but the regulation was not attached. So in the area of prone restraint, we added uh, the regulation 4603. 
Additionally, we added that it must be all prone restraints must be administered in in compliance with 603 CMR 4605 um, because prone restraint is really not prohibited without specific stringent guidelines, and that language needed to be in there, and that comes direct from the regulations. Another add-on was uh, we needed to add the piece that nothing in the regula regulations, any of the regulations or policies or procedures prohibits anyone from um, their lawful obligation as a mandated reporters, essentially. So we had to add that component. <coughs> And we also added that the uh, superintendent, um, al along with you know his or her designee, has a responsibility to ensure that we have good working procedures in place in the district, and uh, that is outlined in an accordance with 4604. So we had to attach that as well. And then we had to add the piece about training and uh, training really training and reporting. Um, the training piece is really just a, a real lengthy highlight and in-depth highlight about what in-depth training looks like. So in our district, we use safety care, which is an in-depth training component, and we've actually extended that to safety care for families in the community. Um, but we needed to make that very clear in our policy that we are adhering to that guideline, <coughs> as well as the reporting requirements. So um, one additional thing that I added um, with the approval of the policy committee in discussion, and actually this discussion came out of the policy committee and I'm grateful for is we added a form for parents. So similar to the bullying reporting form, if students you know, were bullied and there was a situation, parents have a place to go to report. We don't have anything like that pertaining to restraints if parents wanted to you know, file a complaint. So the regulations require that they, you know, there's a process, but it doesn't, it, there was no form. That's not a requirement. So we developed this form, and I can certainly pass it <coughs> along. It is in the, in the link, but you folks can look at it. We developed this form um, for parents, and what I'd like to do is, um, if we all agree that a form should be included in the regulation, in this <coughs> policy, um, part of the work I would do with CPAC in the, when we look at the procedures is also look at the form and refine that form if necessary. Because um, again, that's not a requirement, so we don't have to have the form. It, I just thought it was something nice to have for the community, and we agreed on the, in the policy committee that it would be something nice to have so parents have a place to report. I'm happy to take any questions. Could I ask a <coughs> question just of clarification for the viewers? Sure. Could you describe the difference between prone and physical restraint? Okay. So a prone restraint is a, a restraint face down, lying on the floor. It's not recommended to, unless there are very specific uh, situations, like um, a medical doctor says you can do it in certain circumstances. Okay. There, are, there are specific guidelines. I don't have all of them in front of me, but there are specific guidelines in terms of um, when you can use that type of restraint for any particular type of student based on medical profile, disability profile, a lot of different factors. Uh, restraint for the purpose of restraint is for student safety and there's you know varying forms. You can have you know escorts, you can have holds, you can have you know a, a restraint. One of the one of the requirements of the restraint, which is really important for everybody to know, is it cannot exceed 20 minutes. And but what we have embedded into our uh, procedures is a fixed time release process, which is based on research and based on safety care recommendations. A fixed time release means in our district, if someone is in need of a restraint or hold, we don't do it more than two minutes at a time, allowing that student the opportunity to regroup and us to potentially continue to de-escalate. 20 minutes is a long time and it is allowable by law, but we do not like that. So we allow students the opportunity within two minutes to regroup and for us to continue to de-escalate in the hopes that we can um, help the student get back on track. And that is a recommendation, not a requirement, because the requirement is it can be up to 20 minutes. So we did have to, um, you know, just clarify that in our procedures. And that's something, again, if we work on the procedures further, we can talk about. But um, in my mind, it's a best practice and it's research-based, so. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. So just a point, just in part for us, but also for people at home. My understanding is that restraints are not frequently used in our schools. They're not frequently used. I mean, we last year, I think we had a total of 38 restraints. But 38 can be, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me because yeah. I didn't prepare that data Sorry, today. But it, be, but it could be, but it could be. 
that could be five students in throughout the year that student might need a hold or an escort or um, you know or need to get safely from the playground to the classroom so it, it the numbers could seem alarming but really when you do a deeper dive into the data it it really is not as alarming as it may seem when you because when you think 38 to me 38 sounds like it could be a real lot of restraints in the district but again I haven't prepared that report but um, when you look at it, it is just a variety of scenarios for student safety so I apologize. I did not mean no, to put you on that's the spot. Okay. popped into my head. No, that's okay. Talking. I mean, I'm always looking at the yeah. data, and actually we're in the middle of our re uh, report that we're revising for yeah. the Department of Education based on this citation and needing to, you know, revise our restraint data from last year. But, um, and I'm happy certainly at any point to share out that data and I can prepare a report. But anyway, I, I think we do a good job in the district. We really do in terms of ensuring student safety, all the staff. We have in-depth <laughs> training, which is, again, part of the policy requirement. In-depth training is safety care trained staff, and we have um, multiple staff in various, various um, classrooms trained, intensive in other classrooms, key designated staff at every building level that are safety care trained to ensure that they are implementing these procedures and processes. And if someone was dysregulated in a classroom who's not safety care trained, we also have procedures to be able to alert and involve safety care trained staff to ensure that there is the process is followed because it is a pretty tight process. Um, it's a good process. It's best for students, so student safety. I just, I just wanted to add on from the policy committee. We um, talked about this at length. This um, new policy is very close to the MASC um, recommended policy, which was revised um, in accordance with the new laws. So we checked that out. We confirmed it with um, Dorothy Presser at MASC that that their model policy is current and. Um, I think there may be a couple of small additions for further clarification in ours, but otherwise mm -hmm. it's pretty true. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to say, um, we reviewed the procedure, even though it's not, you know, just where you are today with the procedure. The intent is that when the procedure is finalized, um, it will hang on the policy website under this policy as a, a supplemental um, document as well as form. Mm -hmm. okay. So in terms of community notification, they should have full access um, once you're ready to put the procedure out there to this, the procedure, forms, et cetera. And thank you for saying that. I really appreciate that. Um, so what we will do, because we do have to post the policy for the Department of Education, the procedure is embedded in that, and it probably will be embedded as a link. And again, it's subject to change, but as it currently stands, we do definitely, folks will have access to look at that. Families should know in terms of what we're doing procedurally as it relates to this policy, and it's, it's not a secret. So um, definitely we'll have that link included, as well as the link to this form, um, so all families just have access. And then any changes we make will you know, either come back and do a presentation or provide notification via, you know, the, the district-wide email. Um, but families will definitely be alerted to any changes we make moving forward to procedure. Policy, certainly, we would come back here if we had to, but I think we're in pretty good shape. And that was the distinction. I just wanted to make sure, based on what you just said, too, that, you know, the policy is what we have to approve Correct. Here, but your, you and your department and working with, you know, CPAC. groups in the community, CPAC and, and parents, that's who sort of establishes this procedure. So you have the flexibility to change that when you feel it's appropriate and necessary. Correct. And it doesn't necessarily have to come back to us. Right. So the, the policy is sort of the legal stuff, but the procedures and how it all goes down in practice mm -hmm. in the schools are completely under your pur purview. Right. Thank so you. So it's, it's great that you're communicating with the, the community and, and putting it up there, but the, the policy is the piece that we have to make sure that we right. have under control. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you did a great job. Tons of hours of work. Oh, thank you well, so much. Oh, thank you for participating in the policy committee. I do appreciate it. Oh, I, I think it was a it was a joint collaborative effort among many stakeholders, and I'm looking forward to continuing that collaboration as we examine the procedure as it currently exists with the CPAC board and, and the department. Dr. Zaleski, one uh, question for you: um, with regard to substitute teachers, what kind of training is provided to them? Mm. That's a very great question. So in our in our procedures and policy, for that matter, all staff need to be trained within coming. I think it's within 30 days of coming into the district. So we're working through HR in terms of managing and monitoring how we're going to access that training. Right now, what we do is we have a, a PowerPoint presentation that I've created for the district that um, first day, first within the first two days of school, all staff, including new staff, receive training on that, um, and. You know, my, my assumption, and certainly we would work with HR on this as well as the superintendent, is that we'd take that same training piece and um, allow them the opportunity to have access to that as well. 
All staff, including substitutes, have to be trained in different procedures when they come new to the district. Um, and there's a, a manual and a bunch of modules that they have to review. But w embedded within that, we have embedded this restraint training, and uh, they will receive that as well. Another tricky piece, and I'm glad you're asking this question, Mina, too, is um, what happens if a staff member resigns and then we replace that staff member mid-year? And that is something else that is off also, be you know, we've become aware of throughout this process and ensuring that in conjunction with HR that we uh, make sure all staff have access to this. I actually just had the opportunity to meet with Ms. Polnick last week to look through all of our uh, slides and presentations and make sure they're up uh, up to par in terms of uh, all regulations, not just restraint, um, and this as well, and, and we had that conversation. So I I feel like we're on top of it, and, um, you know, and we'll make sure that you know, we are keeping track of who we're hiring and how they're being trained. Dr. Zaleski, do you want to just clarify that I believe substitutes are trained in the physical restraint regulations, but they're not necessarily or oh, no, we wouldn't expect them to be trained safety in safety care, care procedures that's or a implementing great, restraints. That's a great, a clarification. great point. That. Great yeah. point. Thank you for that. So, um, so in-depth training, all staff are required by law to be trained on the restraint process, and that's the slide PowerPoint presentation I'm talking about. It's all about regulations, the training procedures that we use in district, reporting requirements and procedures. But the in-depth training is only a select group of staff, again, that are trained at the building level in safety care. Um, we choose those people based on principal input, uh, based on student profiles, and uh, based on the classrooms and where these people need to be stationed. So that definitely would not include subs. But subs, like any other employee who's not safety care trained, has access to the information in terms of, in the event a student was dysregulated, what are the steps and what are the, in, in this, that's part of the procedures. What are the steps and what do you do? Um, and how do you elicit the support of a safety care trained staff member? So thank you for asking that because I don't want to give the impression to the community that all subs are trained in safety care because that's not, all staff are not trained in safety care. All staff are trained in procedures, but designated staff are trained in safety care. Thank you. It's helpful. Thank, thank you, Dr. Zaleski. You're welcome. So one quick thing I think is an, um, a typo under implementation. It says uh, number two, pursuant to a student's, it says IP, e, I'm assuming it's supposed to say IEP. Is that? Um, where are you? IP, e, I think. On, what page are we on? On the first page, you go down where it says implementation. It says um, when non-physical interventions would be ineffective, that sentence there. And you go down, pursuant to students' IPE or other written plan developed in accordance. I believe that should be yeah. IEP. I don't are you in the policy or the procedures? Right, are you, because I'm in the, because I don't see that in the policy. I, I'm confused. I'm right here. JKAA. JKAA, right? I think that's the mm -hmm. old policy. Oh, did I flip back? And, okay. We circulated both the old policy oh, and the Oh, that's right. Policy. Yeah, there was a lot of policies floating okay. around. You know what, I flipped back so and So we should be looking at. I think I did pull the. There you go. That's my apologies. So okay. That. That's all right. That's okay. It's a good catch on the other Yes. Okay. And we did, we must have caught that in the policy committee. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thanks so much for all your work on this. And I just wanted to see if the CPAC board had any comments. Our only comment was that um, we, we are excited to work going forward with any implementation um, changes uh, reaching out to the community. Thank you. All right, then if there are no more questions or comments, uh, because this is a regulatory issue, I would like to um, look for a motion on this, even though we typically don't on a first reading. If there are comments that come to us later, we always have the ability to open up for non-regulatory issues to look at. But so moved. So motion by Meg, second. Second. By Jen, and then we'll do a roll call, starting with Amanda. Aye. Meg. Aye. Mina. Yes. Oops, sorry. Aye. <laughs> Jen. Yes. And I am a yes, so that passes. And thank you very much for Thank you, thank you so much. For coming. So, thank, thank you very much. I actually, because we're a little bit behind schedule, I am going to recommend that we take the school improvement plans out of order, because I know that the principals have a lot um, going on this time of year, um, just to move it. And then we will go back with the Elmwood gift account and pick up in the order after the school improvement. So I know the. <laughs> you don't think they want to stay? Do you know, they are fun and interesting, but maybe they want to watch from, you know, home or their offices. Yeah, on their iPhones. On their iPhones. <laughs>
I think these are new chairs. Are new chairs? Uh, yeah. it, they're much more comfy here than we are in the library. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. That you are. <laughs> yes. So, well, hello. It's been a while since we've seen you. So, That's right. thanks for having us. The three great <laughs> So as we began the development of our school improvement plans, we were working together, as we often do. And our first goal, as we were working on social-emotional learning, we initially started with our own schools in mind. And as we worked further, we realized this is so alike. Why not intentionally share this goal across the schools? We always work to promote smooth transitions, alignment within the schools, so we intentionally have the same goal in all three school improvement plans. So our first goal is social emotional learning. It's not a new goal for us, but we're always taking it to the next level to further our work, um, dive deeper into our um, work with staff and capacity for this. So this year, well, there might be slight differences at each building, but something that, um, for example, Hopkins has begun their work so that they are ready to implement an aspect of the report card that addresses social emotional learning. Our levels, Elmwood and Marathon, we're beginning that work, and next year we'll have that in implementation, get feedback and revise. So on that front, Hopkins, you're ahead of us, and that's okay. We're going to learn from them this year. What works we'll make what tweaks, I'm sure. to tweak. But our goal is that preschool through grade five, as we talk about social emotional learning, that we will develop school-wide consistent processes through our schools that students can acquire these skills um, and the attitudes and those core competencies, those five main areas that contribute to strong social emotional learning, which we know positively impacts your self-awareness, your confidence, your academic skills. This is huge. Our children need to feel good and have these skills um, for that great big world that they'll be um, in not too many years down the road. Um, so an example is the report card. Something else um, our assistant superintendent applied for, um, a partnership through DESI with UConn on PBIS, positive behavioral um, support incentives and supports through our schools for um, interventions. While DESI often targets kindergarten through grade, grade three, the teams that will be attending from Marathon and Elmwood will be bringing this back to extend to preschool and grade four or five. So we will be meeting throughout the year with UConn with that expertise uh, at times it's insight in person district meetings and they will be really going over what do we have what are our systems what's the next step bringing in the data analysis so that we have those consistent practices throughout the schools that really build on it so we're thrilled to be in this position and we're thrilled that we were selected to participate in this um, so that's something that we're very excited for something that we're also going to work on um, as a team is having some parent education community forums we often talk about um, these aspects, skills, approaches, supports, and how can we share that information? This is part of what we do every day. And often when we speak to parents, they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, you have to work on this. Oh, I didn't know that, what a great idea. And this is also <coughs> part of teaching academics. So how do we help carry this over to the home, build up those skills? So we'll have some joint presentations um, for the community with that. And while we each have committees within our school, they often don't meet together. So while the work with UConn will help bring that together, we are intentionally scheduling our social emotional learning teams so that Marathon can hear what Hopkins is doing, Hopkins can hear what Elmwood, and we've worked on similar language, so you're not starting over again when you come to a new school to help ease the transition. Oh, I, I've heard of those zones, I know what that means. I know which, I wanna be in the green zone. And um, It's helpful when they hear that going to a new school and they have some tools that um, students can build on. So part of our work is uh, building, and it'll be probably an electronic toolkit, mind you, building the resources and capacity for our staff. The students that join us, even today, at Elmwood, um, <laughs> are coming to us with some different needs than they did five, ten years ago. So building the capacity of teachers, whether it's a related arts teacher, a classroom teacher, um, a specialized subject area, how is it they support the needs of their students? And this is part of what the new state evaluation system is that teachers have this competency so part of our work is building that toolkit so teachers feel successful supportive in um, 
that confidence to be able to meet that no matter where our students are. Can I add one yes. thing on the report card? So um, we mentioned that Hopkins is at a slightly different place. Uh, as part of our school council the last two years, and I think I've shared this before when we've talked about past social emotional learning goals that Hopkins has had, with our school council there's been a lot of conversation, especially about the transition from an elementary model to the secondary model, which is very different. At the elementary school level in Hopkinton, we use standards-based report cards, which look very different than secondary report report cards that are letter-based based on percentages and looking at your homework grade versus your test grade. At the elementary level, we are standards-based. We do have a personal development section, and that's based on competencies. And so as a school council, what we've been talking about is ways to roll the CASEL language into our personal development section. And we've been talking, all three of us in newsletters, I know Mrs. DeBow and Mrs. Carver have as well, have talked about CASEL and the importance important work that they've done nationwide on social emotional learning. We have been doing work with our school council, with our social emotional team at Hopkins on how to merge the CASEL language with personal development. The question about what happens, obviously social emotional learning doesn't end at fifth grade. So I know we've had a lot of conversations with Mr. Keller and Mr. Bishop and they're looking at ways through their processes of how to incorporate those things going forward. It's been a lot of work on admin council about what does that look like for an 11th grader? Because self-awareness is still a critical skill for an 11th grader. Um, Self-regulation, all of these competencies do not end with 11-year-olds. We know that they certainly go forward. And so that will be the work that they will continue in different ways in a secondary look um, moving forward. And we're excited to, to have something that helps build language and understanding of how critical those competencies are for overall success in the future. Jen, I don't know if you want to add anything about our work with UConn, but it is it is a team. So when we talk about building capacity, we have administrators, teachers, um, great representation from our schools. And because, parents this year. Um, and then what you're doing is building that up so that you um, strengthen your systems of support. And then this is something that continues to grow each year. Yeah, and I think the only um, addition I would say is it's actually a three-year yes. um, commitment. So we'll be um, looking at staff and community um, involvement as well, training over the next three years. And a little bit of late-breaking news that the two of you might not know about, but Hopkins is was accepted as well. So oh, we'll hooray! All three of this is great. Schools <laughs> that will be participating. Okay. So we really will have. So we were going place. to share, even if it wasn't official. <laughs> but now we're going to go. <laughs> it is official, yeah. Terrific. Yes. Yeah, so we're very excited about the work, and part of the work is also kind of a train the trainer model. Yeah. So we will have um, staff members going who will come back as trained coaches. So we'll be able to right, yeah. continue the work moving forward. That's yeah, great. That's great. Congratulations. I know, that's <laughs> great. That's great. It's going to be fun. It's going to be good. So that's a goal that I share, uh, well, not I, Marathon with Elmwood and Hopkins. And Anne's going to speak to a goal that Marathon and Elmwood share. So as far as I'm concerned, I, I think the most exciting thing is the work that we're doing together. I think that six years ago when I came to Hopkinton, it was really striking to see that there was a school that ended in first grade, then the kiddos came to me and they started over with things and then it felt like a lot of abrupt things were happening for kids. And something that the three of us have worked really hard on is collaborating so that there's, we know that there are natural transitions for kids, but, but in terms of our processes, it's getting, every year I think it gets a little more mm -hmm. seamless. So um, something that both Marathon and Elmwood have been really focusing on is literacy and how we ensure that students are getting the very best literacy instruction that they can get. Previous um, SIP goals have talked about guided reading and, and reading instruction. And this year, we're really excited at our two schools to be focusing in specifically on vocabulary acquisition and the importance of that. Um, it, the, some of, I, I wrote down a quote from a book that we're, we're planning to do a book study across the two schools this year. Um, and that's going to be exciting work. And the author of the book, Isabel Beck, says that a rich vocabulary is strongly related to reading proficiency in particular and school achievement in general. And what we know is that once students enrich their vocabulary acquisition, they're going to be better readers, better speakers, better thinkers, more curious. Um, and it's really important to focus our work on that. 
Um, some of the things that we'll be doing is work in classrooms, in professional development opportunities, building-based meetings, PLCs. Um, and again, we're really excited to say that we were uh, accepted to participate in a grant between the two schools. We'll each have a team of six teachers, teachers, administrators, the um, ELA director will participate in um, a grant I, for, I believe it's a year, Jen, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. um, we'll have two teams and the teams will be expected to go to two statewide institutes, three regional focus meetings. They will be doing a, a virtual book study that they'll bring to each of the schools and they'll sort of foster the commitment to implement the work. They're going to be learning things that they're going to be bringing back to their colleagues um, and they'll share the work, we'll share that together. Um, we'll be doing some of our work, as I said, in PLCs, in our building-based meetings. Um, we plan to do a kickoff with a vocabulary study. We're also talking, um, one of the uh, exciting ideas was to have a, a one book, one school um, experience where we've, we've chosen a book that every elementary teacher will share in their classrooms and then have a similar activity that kids will do. And then we'll come together to compare what did that look like in preschool? What did that look like in third grade? I think for teachers it's really hard, say in a third grade, to, to realize that lots of good things are happening in preschool. I think every year, especially when you're isolated, you start to think, I've got to do, I've got to start from scratch. And there are obviously everything that we're doing is building from pre-K on. So I think the more uh, opportunity we give to teachers to work on, a, on an opportunity like that, um, teachers start to see preschoolers are talking about vocabulary and words. So what we're doing in third grade better be much higher level than, than what's happening in preschool. <laughs> We've got some great vocabulary, We're going to build big words on the we're things using. that, right. So a vocabulary parade, and, and again, including families in, in our work is going to be important to this process. And the other thing, if you don't mind me adding something in, is we participated in this grant last right. year with teachers from both Elmwood and Marathon. And it's a grant sponsored by the Department of Ed, and this grant is specifically designed for early education. So you can only attend if you're an educator in grades K through three. That's that's how important um, the department feels that this mm -hmm. early foundation um, is to students reading and writing um, and speaking progression. And um, what I was able to see, and we're going to have double, we're going to have double the size team this coming year. Now that we're going into year two, is a really great connection between teachers at mm -hmm. Elmwood. And marathon and when you talk about the abrupt transitions and the inability of our teachers at different grade levels to really interact and get to know one another and really understand so we had some shared lessons with some shared reading that went on um, grades k through three this year with a really nice cohort of teachers who collaborated and worked really closely with their principals and so that will continue this year with an even larger group um, of teachers being involved so put us to both of you for taking that work and running with it well you know what's wonderful when the teachers bring it back is that they're teaching each other's mm -hmm. as much as we mm -hmm. love our jobs it's often more powerful when it comes from within that someone who's walking the walk in a class managing groups can do it and here's an example I took a video of my class and here's the academic book discussion mm -hmm. um, and what a priceless experience that was mm -hmm. to hear these first graders engage with high vocabulary about the book they just read. From across the room, you might have thought they were off task, they're chit chatting, but where this was videoed, wow, how great it was with their opinions, perspectives, and to have that conversation back and forth and adjust your thinking perhaps on what someone else um, just shared, that's so much more powerful than just filling out a worksheet or whatnot. And those are the skills that we're trying to build and develop in our skills. So it, it, it's wonderful that we have added teachers participating while we support and foster and facilitate it. They're really the um, essential components of this work. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> we were excited to come up here as a team because we are just really <laughs> enjoying working together and all of the things at the early levels in literacy build so nicely into what's happening at Hopkins School. And for Hopkins this year, um, we have two academic goals beyond the social emotional goal that we share. And the second goal that you saw in your packet is our literacy goal. We have really focused the last two years on fully implementing and bringing into Hopkins work that again starts 
back with those kindergartners with SRSD writing. And we feel like we've gotten to a very good place with the implementation of that to continue the work. We want to circle back to our guided reading instruction at Hopkins School. This year, if you look through this goal, it's really about our readers workshop and how we make sure that that's a rich experience for all of our students. For the last two years, knowing that Fontes and Pinnell was putting out um, what's called Fontes and Pinnell Classroom, and the materials for the upper grades, fourth through sixth grade, are literally being published right now. We've been carefully managing our money and our funds, both through our HPTA um, work and partnering with HPTA, but also our school curriculum monies to find ways to purchase Fontes and Pinnell Classroom. Not the entire program, and um, Irene Fontes would say it's not a program. What for me it's about is high quality literature and books and texts. And um, rather than spending a lot of money on continuing to say a computer program is going to teach to read, we know what kids need is lots and lots of texts. We have in any fourth or fifth grade classroom students reading, if you talk about their guided reading level, anywhere from an F, G, H, K's all the way down to students who enter Hopkins School perhaps at a U or V. That's an entirely, a huge range of readers. But the, the wonderful part about Reader's Workshop is you have students working with texts at those different levels with a teacher who is going to strategically move them along from where they are with texts at that level. That's one component. We need to have high quality texts to do that. And it's not always about putting a novel in a child's hand. Oftentimes, it's about short texts. Um, even books that were published five years ago for guided reading were not exactly high quality. And so to get at what a you reader needs in terms of the Fontes and Pinnell continuum of learning stra strategies, they weren't seeing what they needed in those texts. And so with these new materials, these new books and texts, we will have an opportunity to really expand what we do in Reader's Workshop in ter terms of guided reading and then the entire Reader's Workshop experience. The challenge is obviously the staffing, and so the other piece of this is both learning walks for them to see each other in practice, observe, see what it looks like in other classrooms, but also very strategic scheduling so that we're looking at ways for our reading specialists, our learning specialists, our paraprofessionals. What is a paraprofessional doing so that the classroom teacher can be taking that group of students who might be all around yous and giving them strategies to move forward while a paraprofessional is supporting perhaps word work with another small group? And the reading specialist might have a book club with some heterogeneous groupings of students who are all interested in this fantasy topic. And it's, it's heterogeneous grouping. So that is what a real reader's workshop should look like. It should be heterogeneous groupings and also homogeneous groupings around specific skills and strategies development. And we want to make sure that that's what we're doing in literacy, and that's the heart of this goal. The last goal is um, in mathematics. And one thing I did want to say to the public, um, our fifth grade this year, for the first time, is going to be a little more fully de um, departmentalized. Certainly not a middle school model. Our teachers are still elementary teachers. And so at the fifth grade, all 12 of our sections, students will have a reading teacher and a math teacher, which allows us to do a lot more professional development and is why I felt it was really critical to keep both of these goals here. Because we have fifth grade teachers who are going to be specializing in math. And we think with the level and complexity of fifth grade math today, that's really important to take six of our fifth grade teachers and they will be teaching two sections of math and um, the other six will be teaching two sections of reading and honing their, their skills and craft in that area. So this math goal, last year we were really focusing on bringing Eureka in, establishing a, so a scope and sequence, building rigor in our math program. This year is about taking that and saying we know a workshop model with guided practice is critical. We know we have students who are walking in the door and have mastered many of the basic standards. What do we do for them? And so this is looking at enrichment reteaching and then essential standards because the scope and sequence for fifth grade math is very quick. And so how do we manage that huge frameworks that the state gives us and make it manageable for students who may need to move at a slightly different pace 
um, whether that is at a much faster pace because they've already mastered some of the basics um, or much of the curriculum, and then for other students who need more time and reteaching. And so that's the basic of our third goal. We're going to be very busy. I love that I love that you guys are here together. I think this is it's so great. And I think in the last, I don't know, five years or whatever, between the collaboration between the middle school and the high school and you guys, I think the students are really um, benefiting hugely and families kind of decode what happens in, in our district. Yeah. So it's really nice that you're working so closely together. Yeah. I love that you guys put in the parent education forums and I love that you're doing them together. Maybe fewer of them, but more yep. mm -hmm. focused. I think so much of the learning reinforcement happens at home, and parents don't always know what it is they should be doing. So I thank you for that. And um, the only other question, the only question I really had was, um, has there been any conversation about, and probably this is maybe an HPTA question, but I'll ask you, um, about introducing competitions or games around vocabulary like spelling bees or word masters or with math like a math leagues or whatever at the elementary age because kids of those families like to work on those together mm. too and I didn't know if there'd been any conversation on that. I can speak at Hopkins. I do run um, Continental Math League which is an enrichment math program for students after school. It's by application. And that is something open to all of our fourth and fifth graders. We encourage that it's a student-driven process. Mm -hmm. um, I do that after school because we know that that's an additional um, interest of a lot of our students, and I want to ensure that we're providing that. We also know a lot of families go outside of the school for different kinds of enrichment, and certainly that's a family choice. Um, in the past, there had been uh, a word masters at, the, uh, at our level. One of the things that we see is a lot of students, we know from surveying students the last couple of years, stress and anxiety is driven by a lot of competition. And I purposely made the choice because it had been a principled run, um, Word Masters competition team and a continental math, that I switched and went to our Hawk Squad, which is community service. Mm -hmm. I wanted to promote collaboration of students, knowing that there are a lot of opportunities out there for students to participate in competition. And certainly, by the time you get up to the middle school, those opportunities even grow more because they do their extracurriculars in a different way. So I think partnering with HPTA based on interests certainly is a wonderful way to do it. As far as what I can offer as a principal, I sort of balance Continental Math League, which does have a comp competition component, but is also very collaborative. You come in there, the most exciting thing for me is seeing 10 children struggle with a math program problem that may find some of the stuff in the classroom to be very, relatively easy. The rigor is very high. They struggle together. And so it's a different kind of competition, which is why I love it. Um, I love hearing the math discourse with those children after school. Does that answer your it question? Does, yeah. Your enthusiasm about your schools and your programs is contagious. <laughs> and it's really been a pleasure over the past year and a half to witness these conversations developing between the three graces, as I imagine. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, yeah. I, I mean, I think I love your goals. I think a tremendous amount of thought went into them, which is fantastic. But even more, what Amanda said earlier, we had a conversation, it might have been my first year on school committee, could have been last year, but it was about how there was, you know, the, this sort of segmentation as kids went from one school to the next. So I so appreciate the three of you coming together so much and putting so much time and energy into streamlining the process. We and felt it too. Did you? Yeah. You and felt so it? so it was important to us. Yeah, yeah to, it was. To feel like, you know, well, Lauren would say something or Vanessa would say something that they were doing and I would think, well, that would be perfect for me too. Yeah. Could we do it together? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's kind of grown organically. And it time. makes great sense. It really does. And the kids now know what to expect when they yeah. move from one building yeah. to the next. Yeah. It's a new place. It's new people. But the expectations are very similar. The language yeah. is similar. And yeah. so that makes it And there's a sense easier. of comfort in that, that it's oh, familiar. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I also want to congratulate you on, and, and yeah. Jen, too, on Thank the you. grants and, and UConn. I mean, that's huge. Definitely. So it shows how the, the school community, the administrators, the leaders are all looking for ways to, to mm -hmm. um, you know, where we're concentrating on budget and our growing yep. student population, you're finding 
alternative ways to fund these amazing projects that help the teachers, the parents, the students. So I'm so grateful for that. Um, and then I guess, you know, just in general, I, I really appreciate all the work that you three do for the, for the littles <laughs> and how they really, really blossom from pre-K all the way through fifth grade. So fantastic. Go job. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to piggyback off of that because I, I do remember back in the day where each school felt like kind of a different yeah. silo. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you guys have worked so intentionally to do that. And I think that's a strength, both of each of you individually, but also of the benefit of having the stability of having the three of you mm -hmm. in, as the stability in the admin team in general has really yes. provided so much for our district. And I think this is like something I look at it like, wow, the three of you just seem like and also the other principals don't want to leave them out. But <laughs> to, to take it to a new Alan's level. Alan's starting to feel bad. Just so <laughs> there was something a couple years ago. I said it. I, he reminds me every often, every so often. Yes. But you take this to a new level every year, and I feel like I, I, I each year I think, wow, this is even better. But it yeah. really, it's kudos to all of you. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Before, before they go uh -huh. away. Could we have Mrs. Carver introduce her new assistant I'm principal? Oh, that would oh, be nice. Wonderful. Yes, Jason Demon is here with us today. He um, started on the 1st of July. Um, yes. <laughs> Why not be on TV? Moving slow, Jason. Come up here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Jason is our new assistant principal. Congratulations. And, uh, he, Thank you very much. He's, made it, he's already made a really very positive impact on Elmwood. He, every teacher who has slowly trickled in, we, we actually decided to share an office this year um, because we're busting and, and we don't want to, um, you know, we, we don't want to make it seem as though we each need these, these grand spaces and be apart. So much of our work will be together that we act, decided to physically um, have our space shared. And every teacher that has come into Elmwood School to say hello, he has already made, oh, I, I used to live there. Oh, I worked there once. Oh, I have a friend. Every single, I, and I'm sitting in the background with my mouth hanging open thinking, how does he so instantly make a connection with every person who has stepped through the door? I'm really excited about what's to come. So welcome to yeah. Welcome. Welcome, Mr. Beeman. All the work that the committee does, and it's been a great district, and uh, looking forward to helping out. Great. Thank you. Welcome. We're happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. I do have um, some comments, if I may, oh. before uh, principals <laughs> leave. I, I think what you presented is extremely thoughtful. It's concise, but all the thought process that went in comes out very clearly. I love the fact that you focus so much on social emotional learning. I think I think there's no doubt. I see that all throughout all five schools, it's extremely important that that be the be the groundwork that's laid very, very strongly. I also love seeing the words consistency, that you're trying to bring some consistent processes there, and also toolkits. Um, I see that mentioned throughout that you are looking to develop toolkits to help um, everyone um, so that they have the necessary supports as all the growth and all the work that you're undertaking. I'm hopeful, you know, obviously this is so concise, I would imagine there's so much more detail that goes in behind the scenes. I'm hopeful that promotion of pathways to seal of biliteracy will also occur as part of your work. Um, I have one question for you, which is that in the process when you undertake uh, in coming up with the SIPs, what are, is the information data points you take in from students and parents? So I think discussions center at faculty meetings, building-based meetings, school council mm -hmm. meetings where we have parent representation, um, and some of it's even informal feedback that we receive over the course of the year through meetings and conversations with parents. And I don't know if you and, want to And at that. admin council as well, yep. where we all collaborate and, and kind of think about what does it, you know, we, we talk about what does a Hiller look like, what do we want students to, to look like who do we want them to be and how do we get there it's sort of backward design we think about what we're hopeful to have and and where does that work begin and how will we get there and we ensure that we align with the district district plan so that okay here's the district plan what can we do to contribute to that this is what's going on in our schools and mind you while these are our you know high priority goals there are many other things that we're working on that just might not be mm -hmm. highlighted here 
I would totally agree with that. If you look at our district strategy that Dr. Kavanaugh has, has had all of us work so closely over the last or more than a year, really, to formulate um, some of the same language that's in there, um, fostering diverse opportunities for success. I mean, I think that that really goes hand in hand with all of the work in the, the district strategy. So I would say that piece and then certainly the component of school council because it brings together parents from the community and educators within the schools and administrators together. Really critical work. Thank you. I was actually speaking with Dr. Kavanaugh and saying that it must not be easy where you have laid out a strategic plan. How do you carve out what is it that you're going to do in year one, right? What, what becomes your priority? And I guess my question was coming from there. Obviously, the strategic plan already includes so many voices, mm -hmm. yep. right? And, um, you know, from all sides. And um, so how do you incorporate some of this school admin and especially for the younger grades i think um, getting student voices what their experiences are like i think that's always a challenge i'm mm -hmm. sure you speak with them every so often and they'll probably tell you uh, could we have more recents did they say that's that right. to you yes Chocolate well we now. didn't get the pool that they wanted in marathon so we'll try for some other things yeah. <laughs> Right. So that's all where my question was coming from. I appreciate uh, all the effort you put in. And I was so happy to see that picture of all of you at that retreat that you had. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we had a lot of, a lot laughs. of laughs. It's a nice way to start the year. Lots mm -hmm. of laughs. That's great. Thank right. you. All right. Thank you. Thank well, you good very luck. much. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Great to see you too. All right. Mr. Keller. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hi. Hi. How are you? How are you? I'm well, thank you. I apologize for my awkward entrance into the studio. We were having our uh, <laughs> annual inspection from the building inspector and fire department, so I uh, came a little bit late and walked in front of the screen, so Did my apologies there. <laughs> I noticed, and now that you pointed it out, <laughs> I'm going to think about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I want to start by thanking uh, the school council. Uh, school council, as I think I know several of you know, um, is a um, a really important uh, uh, group that works with uh, building administration educators to develop the school improvement plan. Um, so we have, um, like all school councils, we have a lot of teachers and community representation and parents. And so uh, I want to acknowledge everybody that uh, dedicated their time and energies uh, to that this past year. Um, so we have three goals. For the coming year. Uh, the first is uh, entitled High Levels of Learning for All. Um, those of you that um, have been engaged in this process for the, for the past several years know that as a middle school, our focus area, one of our focus areas that consistently comes up is our work around professional learning communities and response to intervention, so PLCs and RTI. Um, and our major efforts for these past several years have been focused on building and refining our curriculum and our assessments uh, and the sharing of instructional practices. Um, and so this past year and uh, in the uh, year coming, and years coming rather, um, we want to continue doing that work, but also very carefully examining classroom state and school assessments uh, to make sure that we're addressing the needs of, of all of our learners and, and what, what we do with that assessment data ultimately. So uh, when we're meeting with our professional learning communities, so when I say that, I refer to say three eighth grade science teachers who sit down and look at the assessment data and draw some, um, make some conclusions about what they see. This past year, we did a lot of work with our English department, um, meeting with, the, and when I say we, I'm talking about us as administration, uh, sitting down and looking at um, the state MCAS data, looking at some writing samples and drawing some conclusions and having conversations about what we see in the writing and where we might be falling short and where we're actually doing quite well. Um, so we began that work this past year and made some really uh, strong inroads and made some, um, drew some conclusions from that, and as you will recall, uh, back in the spring uh, around program of studies time, uh, as a result of some of that, we felt as though we had a, a tremendous need in grade six to continue with um, reading instruction and enhance our reading instruction. So this year, uh, beginning of the fall, we have an actual an additional block of literacy in grade six. Um, so part of our work is going to be examining that new class in grade six, that, with that additional block of English in grade six, and see how that's working and how it's benefiting our students. 
Um, and uh, we also, around instructional practices this year, um, uh, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Kavanaugh and Dr. Parson, um, Mr. Bishop and I uh, both have um, educators that are taking part in a FUSE, um, uh, a FUSE program, which is from the Highlander Institute, which uh, gets uh, two teachers at each of our buildings trained in instructional practices. Uh, we also have, uh, and so they actually help um, uh, the school, and, and we have people that come into our school that work with teachers in our school to uh, they identify a problem of practice and how we're going to improve some of our instructional practices. Um, we are also engaged this year in, um, uh, in addition to the professional development, looking at those instructional practices as, as a school-wide building. Um, we're asking our department, um, our department meetings to run more of a, as a professional learning community. A lot of times, uh, like I think all of us, we can our meetings wind up being uh, around uh, agenda items and business items. And we're trying to encourage people to uh, email those things and use the face-to-face -face time for uh, diving into some academic goals. And so, uh, for instance, our English department, uh, I think it was... Um, uh, Mrs. Dubo, I think maybe mentioned uh, earlier the uh, book by Isabel Beck, and so we're doing a book study in our uh, English department. I know we had a teacher this past year that took a course in vocabulary, and she's very excited about bringing vocabulary practices um, to our school. Uh, so that's um, the emphasis on goal number one. Uh, goal number two relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, this has been an area of focus for us um, for uh, for a while, and it really um, uh, became um, it came to it didn't come to light, but it was really very powerful when uh, Assistant Superintendent Parson and I met with a grade six student last year, who talked about his experience uh, in the school and in the schools, and um, as a um, as a student not necessarily not frequently encountering. Um, people in, in his studies that looked like him or that uh, went through a same, similar experience to him. Uh, and so that's, we, we've known that, we've known, we've known we need to do some work around that, and that was one of those powerful moments when you have a student speaking very eloquently uh, about uh, something that has impacted him in such a way. And um, so we as a staff have talked about, um, and, and at our admin retreat, uh, we also talked about um, the windows and mirrors, and so at times we need to look through the window and see people that um, look different than us, and at times we need to look in a mirror and see people that look like us, and that's important to have both of those experiences. So that's some of the work that we're doing as, a, as an entire school around curriculum and ensuring that our curricular materials um, address both of those areas. Um, again, along with the high school, um, last year we received a grant um, through the Hopkinton Education Foundation to work with the Anti-Defamation League. So last year we had uh, training for our staff and we had uh, students who were trained in being facilitators of um, practices that are, that. Um, focus on inclusivity. Um, so this year we have already scheduled uh, when those students will be meeting with their fellow students to, to address certain topics. Uh, we also have a training coming up for um, our current seventh grade. So last year we had seventh and eighth graders are trained and the, the, the plan is to keep moving that forward, have seventh and eighth graders uh, each year who are um, uh, versed in, in that curriculum. Um, the other big piece, and so we've had power of we. Uh, for many years, and that is a curriculum uh, essentially created by our guidance department um, that is delivered during homeroom or during our Hiller block. Um, and it is usually a five minute um, segment that involves looking at a video or looking at a PowerPoint presentation and the teacher leading a conversation with students on a particular topic around, say, inclusivity or around diversity uh, or around individual <laughs> self reflection. Um, and we've also had many conversations as staff about advisory and, and where, where and if advisory fits into our school. Um, so we feel like it's really important to determine our path forward with power of we or advisory. And so that's going to be a point of emphasis this, this upcoming year in our professional development time together is to look at these programs and look at the data and the research on what uh, will have the greatest impact. Um, this past year, we introduced a guidance seminar to our grade six students. Um, that was in place of a media literacy, so we removed media literacy from grade six and replaced it with guidance seminar, which uh, has been an opportunity for all grade six students um, to um, be instructed in, um, in, in areas around that guidance counselors don't necessarily have the opportunity to do. And so, 
Um, and it's also an opportunity for all students to meet the three guidance counselors. So uh, Mrs. Brown in grade six, everybody has an opportunity to meet her because they're coming into grade six and that's uh, the main point of contact. But uh, Mr. Vera, who's our um, grade and will be our grade eight counselor this year, and Mr. Meehan, um, who also have who also have strengths in instruction, have an opportunity to meet with kids and know that uh, at any time a kid can walk into the guidance office and see a familiar uh, face there. Uh, the other piece around diversity, equity, inclusion that I want to mention is uh, we've been working, again, uh, credit to Dr. Kavanaugh mm -hmm. and Assistant Superintendent uh, Parsons around our relationship with Keefe Tech. Uh, so Mr. Vera, who I mentioned a moment ago, has been uh, part of a committee that's been working with um, Carla Crisofulli at the high school uh, around figuring out how we can continue to enhance that relationship with Keefe Tech. Uh, through community partnerships, I've already had a conversation uh, about different ways to bring people in uh, into the school. And I know Mr. Vera has already done that this past year in guidance seminar, reaching out to people in the community to come in and talk to our students and so they can begin to think about careers uh, and see uh, a variety of careers in that realm. And the third goal is around voice, choice, and engagement. Um, so for the past several years on our school council, um, it has been a, a major uh, point of emphasis on, on several members there around our, uh, our offering, our non-academic offerings. Um, so the, those that happen during the school day and those that happen outside of the school day. And um, so I, I always feel the need to, in, in conversations like this, um, whether it be at school council or here, to, to uh, advocate that I believe that our related arts program works really well. Uh, and I do believe that um, having required related arts courses is an important component of that. I don't feel as though, because I, ultimately I feel like most 12, 13, and 14 year olds, uh, if given a choice of things, would choose things that they're already comfortable with. And so I, I believe that we need to, in many cases, uh, or in all cases actually, when it comes to related arts, force them to uh, enter something that they may not have comfort with or familiarity with. And oftentimes what we find is people, uh, students become, let's say robotics for instance, become really excited about robotics and they never, never previously had an experience. Um, having said that, I also recognize that um, choice is an, is an important human component. And so uh, we've talked about do we want to look at grade eight a little bit on a related arts schedule and, and say uh, if we open this up for choice, um, what would happen? So you have you take you know engineering in grade six and grade seven, and then in grade eight you have the opportunity to look at something a little bit different, um, and uh, and say that I really like art and I want to dive a little bit deeper into studio art. Um, so that's one of the things that we're going to spend time looking at. Um, with that, even you know beyond the idea of it. Um, we have to look at the logistics of it because we still have to have, um, you know, 850 students with a place to go. Um, so there's going to be a lot of scheduling implications to that. So that's uh, one of the things that we're going to study um, throughout the year. Um, and then uh, the, I guess the last piece uh, around that was around our um, social emotional. So Mrs. Bellello mentioned earlier uh, Castle. I know Mr. Bishop has worked, done a lot of work with Castle. Um, in terms of social emotional learning uh, and that is going to be one of our points of emphasis um, uh, in the upcoming years doing some professional development um, and having having some staff our guidance staff our counseling staff explore what it would look like to have a rubric in place where we are helping students to develop some of these skills around uh, not just those, the social emotional uh, social emotional piece but also the independence and are, are we ensuring that um, e at each grade level, so at the end of grade six, students have met certain skill levels at, at the end of grade seven and at the end of grade eight, and so they're ultimately prepared for freshman year, which is some of the feedback, a lot of the feedback that we've heard from uh, school council parents in that there's been kind of a mixed, um, um, a mixed um, reaction, I guess, depending on what team or what teacher you might have. Um, you have been forced to be a little bit more independent or a little bit uh, less independent. So we want to make sure that students are getting a consistent experience. So those are the three goals for the middle school. I apologize for speaking quickly. Not at all. No. Can I, I just have a question about the um, in general. Like, are any of them mandated by the by DESE or I mean? Uh, no, well, I, I, so uh, PE, there are certain requirements around PE, physical education, uh, but no, none of, the, none of the courses in our related arts, uh, at least as far as I'm aware of, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, are, uh, yeah, correct. Okay. 
So I love, uh, and I know we talked about this back during the budget, but I love the addition of the extra block for the literacy. Mm -hmm. I, the, I, I also am curious about the Keefe Tech increasing that collaboration. Is that to increase access for students who might be interested in pursuing Keefe Tech as a high school option or to pool resources or something else? Do you want to speak to Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that also came out of a DESI grant that we are part of, and the grant is titled Career Technical Education, and the overarching goal for this grant is to help um, familiarize students, families, and staff with different pathways, yeah. essentially different career pathways. So not every child is on a four-year college right. path, not every child is going to be a teacher, doctor, lawyer, um, and there are all different types of careers that we don't even know. We don't even know in five years what the careers will be when these kids graduate. And I think that um, it would be great if we could come back and actually do a little more presentation on this once yeah. we kind of get yeah. this all um, solidified. But there are essentially four um, major areas that we're looking at. One is creating some internships at the high school for students. And Evan, I know you can speak more to this. Um, internships in the work area. Um, one is looking at helping students to acquire um, one interested different types of certifications that can be applied directly to a career path. Um, one is looking at alternative um, education such as Keefe. Mm -hmm. So um, we've done some promotion of Keefe and what they offer, but I think just like we evolve, they evolve as well, and we want to make sure that everyone has updated information. And we know, like you've said this, um, Dr. Cavanaugh, that a lot of families make decisions about students' educational pathways as early as fifth grade. Yeah. And if we kind of throw information at kids in the second half of eighth grade, we've lost some opportunities for students. Um, so we really want to develop um, a good working relationship with Keep Tech. Um, and the, the other area that we really want to work on is um, promoting some, edu some education for our faculty um, from, probably, probably goes early as elementary, but right now we're really focusing on middle school and high school, both with our faculties um, our guidance department, et cetera. Oh, and the other, the other thing that we're looking at also is creating some career resources and pathways that we'll be able to share out with families, um, specifically for students who may have disabilities that also may not be going in a traditional pathway. Um, so this is kind of one step in that larger yeah, that's picture. That's great. That's great. Also love uh, the, your, around the diversity, equity, inclusion, your school climate um, goal in there. So well done. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, and I, I, you know, I second that. The other thing that I think really just stood out to me was the voice choice and engagement. That's pretty cool. I think that the kids, you know, there are things that they need to try right. and then maybe dismiss. <laughs> yeah. But but I think that giving them the opportunity to choose, you're, I, I, I would suspect you're going to see a lot of success in that. And I think the other piece, maybe the challenge for all of us, is that you got to have the good teachers in those roles to give them the opportunity. You know, you hear so many kids say things like, I didn't think I was going to like physics, and I had this awesome right. physics teacher, right. and now I love physics because of the teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, it yeah, made such a huge point. difference. So, I think um, you know, as you move ahead with that, we got to figure out how to bring in, or you know, train the folks that you already yeah. have to make it really engaging for the kids. It's a great idea. Good point. Thank That's you. Cool. And I, I love the emphasis on diversity and equity and inclusion, particularly at this age. They're struggling so much to figure out their own identities. It's great that there's emphasis on learning the value of other identities. Yes, thank you. So. Yeah, you know, I love that, as we've talked before about, you're embracing the extension of the learning through the extracurriculars and the, the idea that um, a robust extracurricular set of offerings can really apply a lot of what kids learn or or fill in gaps, even like um, social skills. And I love, I know you've got the sort of free play hours in the in the gym on certain days yes. and for different gym games and I mean the mix and variety of extracurriculars I think can make a huge that's difference true. for the students so I love that that's continuing to appear in your efforts. Yes and as you know when we talked long ago uh, about uh, ways to, to um, you know I think we talked about a kind of a certificate program or that kind of thing that's still something that um, believe it or not is still something that we're having conversations about to try and um, um, see that students have an opportunity to uh, try something in, in a variety of categories and so they have that opportunity and that exposure to uh, different things. That's, that's also part of this kind of on the um, simmering as part of, of part of the school. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. That's great.
Mina, did Mr. You... Keller, yes, yes uh, I do have some comments, Nancy. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Keller, I'm also very excited to see the thoughtful presentation you have put forth, uh, specifically around uh, the cultural sensitivity. I think, uh, you know, the changes, it seems that you're suggesting to some of the readings and curriculum, I think they'll go a long way. Um, Thank you. So very excited about that. Uh, I have a more general question, it may not be just for you, this is again something I would uh, brought up briefly with Dr. Kavanaugh, is as you all put together the steps and you know you have the measurement criteria listed out, right, success criteria, mm -hmm. um, how do you measure that, uh, you know, midway through the year or through the end of the year as to how you're doing? How, how is it coming along? I mean, and, and in certain cases, uh, perhaps some of the things may not pan out as you planned it. So how do you track that? Yeah, I mean, some of the things are certainly, um, you know, more difficult than, than others to, to, to measure. And um, so, you know, a lot of times we default or defer to a survey, which I think can give uh, some good information and be helpful. But in other cases, um, you know, it's, it's, it, some of these can, can really be tricky. And, and ultimately, like when we sit down as a school council and, and talk about different goal sets, you know, those are some of the things that we sometimes struggle with and wind up um, changing uh, the, the goal area or making it a, a larger or a smaller category, depending upon that. But, um, you know, so like in some of these, I don't know if there was a specific one, um, but, you know, in some of these, it's, are we actually, um, you know, are, have we established a data protocol for uh, for teachers and are we regularly having conversations? I mean, one of the things that um, I'm going, you know, kind of going back to goal number one right now, but one of the things that um, that you know, teachers kind of groan about, um, I'm painting with a broad brush right now, but is when we talk about data. Uh, and so, um, cause that's not why most people, you know, get into teaching, but, um, there's a lot of good information in the day. And I think that working through some of those protocols and working with teachers and making them feel comfortable with looking at some of that data and some decisions we can make about that, um, are, are really important work. And I think can actually be pretty exciting if, if done the right way. So, you know, for instance, for me and in goal number one, I'm focused on, uh, Mrs. Late, Mrs. Ben Benick and I getting to those department meetings and those PLCs and getting people comfortable, getting people comfortable and utilizing data protocols when, when looking at, at different assessments. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Yes, thank you. Bravo. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Two weeks going. <laughs> I know. I'm counting. <laughs> two weeks. It's been two weeks, too. Huh? Hello, everyone. Hi. Nice to see you. Hope your summers are going well. Too fast. Yeah. Too fast. I know. We have all of our orientations next week, so we're getting excited to go to high school. So. Um, I know I say this every year, it's really nice to have the opportunity to go last in this presentation, to be able to see um, my colleagues and listen to their passion and all the great things that they have going on at their schools. And, and, and to see the alignment, I think, is really special. I, I haven't worked in too many districts, uh, but I, would, I, I can't imagine it's, it's as aligned as we are. And it's just a, it's, it's really nice to be a part of it. So um, thank you for the work that you do. Uh, I also want to thank everybody around the table for moving this presentation to August. Um, in the past, it's been at the end of May, the beginning of June, and I think it's a really challenging time for all of us with the amount of things that are going on. Um, and this is an important document that guides our work for the year, and having a little bit more time to kind of fine tune it and look into it was really appreciated. So I just want to thank everybody around the table. And I also want to thank my school council, or the high school school council. Um, we have 26 members of the council, so we do have probably one of the largest councils around. Um, but it's great to get such a diverse group of people in the room and, and hear from so many different uh, opinions and thoughts. Uh, they were wonderful in helping to create this document, uh, as well as our work with NEASC, which I know you're aware of. Uh, each uh, 10 years you have to get reaccredited by the NEASC uh, organization. And in the eighth year they come around and do what they call a collaborative conference. So, so that's what happened this past year. And so a lot of work was done in school council. And a lot of our goals are related to some of the recommendations that NEASC gave us. Um, they, they had a lot of positive things to say about what we are doing at the high school, um, far more than any, anything that they, we needed to work on. But some of the things that they talked to us, we really tried to take and implement here in our document. So uh, we do also have three goals. Um, the first is around a vision of the graduate. Uh, you may have heard of this before. Some call it a portrait of a graduate. Um, this is uh, something we've been talking about at the high school even before the collaborative conference at NEASC. 
uh, but it is part of the reaccreditation process. So you are expected to come up with a vision of the graduate for your, for your students. And so um, our, our process would be by November of 2020, uh, we'll have a document in place of what our vision of the graduate is. And what I mean by that is we need to identify kind of the skills, the habits, uh, and the attributes that we want to see our students and ultimately our graduates possess and exhibit by the time that they walk out the doors of, of Hoppington High School. And um, you can go in a lot of different ways, uh, and what you want to focus on, I think, really is the challenge uh, that we have in front of us. Uh, so a lot of this work will be done in our school council, but it will also be done with parent input, student input, and staff input. Um, you know, there are a lot of models out there, schools that have gone through this process already. So if you were to search online, you'll see a lot of different portraits and visions of graduates. And it's interesting to see what districts are focusing on, um, and I'm excited for that work. Uh, I think it's, it's going to be a combination of not only what's going on at the high school, but what's going on in the district as well, kind of talking about what we value. Do we want independent thinkers? Do we want perseverance? Do we want growth mindset? What do we want as part of this document? And it's not just about the document. I think it's important. There's a lot of flashy, nice documents out there, but it, the real work is making sure it's meaningful for everybody that's part of it. And I think a lot of times you do these things and you put something together and then it sits on the shelf and you don't really assess it or evaluate it. And I think it's really important that if we're going to go through this work, it needs to be meaningful, it needs to be authentic, and we all need to agree on some of the things that we want to focus on. So that really is the work ahead, I think, between now and, and November 20th, uh, is coming up with those uh, skills and habits and attributes and competencies, whatever you want to call them. Like I said, they, uh, people call them different things. And then uh, from the November 20th on is how are we going to assess it? How are we going to make sure that every student at the high school is exposed, exhibits, and possesses these, these different skills and, and knowledge sets? Um, some schools do it differently, where one department might take a skill, and then they create a rubric, and they assess it through a project or something like that. Other schools take all of the different attributes and skills that you are identifying and having it go across the school. And I think in the early conversations that we've been having in our school councils, we'd like to create something that goes across the school, not just departmentally. So um, that really is uh, our first goal. If we're able to create and get feedback and, and get comfortable with what we feel is the vision of the graduate, we can start working on how we want to assess it before November tw uh, 2020. We just want to make sure that um, that is kind of our timeline. We have to make sure we have something in place by November 2020, not the assessing part, but the document itself. So that is our, our first goal. Uh, our second goal is a social emotional learning goal. I know uh, both um, Alan and, and, and Vanessa and Lauren and Ann spoke about it already. Uh, I think it's wonderful that we're all taking a look at this together as a district. I think it's extremely important. Um, just a quick aside, I was fortunate enough uh, to be able to attend two principals conferences this summer. One, the national conference, which happened to be in Boston, which was nice. Um, although it would have been better if it was like in Florida, I suppose. But anyway. Um, <laughs> In the, yeah, Southern California, San Diego. Um, and then the Massachusetts principal one, which is always in Cape Cod. And both keynote speakers at both of these conferences were social-emotional experts. Mm -hmm. And over half the workshops that were going on at both of these conferences focused around SEL and the different competencies and the CASEL work, the collaborative academic and social-emotional learning. And they're really the premier group that puts out a lot of information for schools to, mm -hmm. to access. Um, and to me, it's, 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 and we've focused on this, we harp on it at all of our faculty meetings. It's about relationships, it's about building connections with the kids, it's about collaborating with one another and creating that safe and comfortable environment. Because if you don't have that, students are not going to learn at the level that they need to be. And, and so we need to make sure that we continue to build positive relationships. Um, I think we've done quite a bit when it comes to social emotional learning. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about challenge success in a second. Um, we've done some things around the culture and climate of the school, uh, whether it be creating Hiller Days, which will be every Friday this year, starting in October, which we're excited about, or homework-free weekends and vacations. Uh, we've done a lot around mindfulness, movement breaks. So there's, there's been a lot of school-wide things that we feel like we've been doing around this topic. This year, the work is going to be how do we embed it more in the classroom? How do we take those competencies of social uh, and self-management, self-efficacy, growth mindset, um, perseverance, how do we incorporate that into the classroom and measure it? So there is definitely a connection between the social-emotional learning goals that we have and the vision of the graduate. There's a lot of crossover there. Uh, I think some of the competencies can be part of some of the vision of the graduate because those are things that we value. So, that to me, we all want kids who are academically challenged and engaged. I think we do a really good job of that at the high school. We need to put as much effort, if not more, into making sure the students are socially adjusted and emotionally um, uh, mature as well. And so that really is going to be the work, uh, taking some of those competencies, not, maybe not necessarily on a report card at the high school level, but maybe at some point, 
uh, but coming up with rubrics in ways that, s that staff can work with students when it comes to some of these different competencies. And then we'd like to be able to assess it as well. And we're still kind of tweaking how that might work at the high school. It's a little bit different when it comes to the report card and GPAs and reporting to colleges. So, um, But we are looking forward to that work. So that really is um, what we're doing when it comes to the social-emotional learning. But I do want to talk a little bit more about some of the things that um, Ms. Parson mentioned and, and, and Mr. Keller. Uh, when it comes to um, challenge success, and that kind of connects a little bit to that, that grant that we were talking about earlier, as part of this goal, we were very fortunate, someone in the community uh, helped fund um, the challenge success, being able to work with them this upcoming year. Uh, challenge success, if you may not be aware of it, is a, it's an organization out of Stanford University that works with school communities all around the country. Um, and what they do is they come in and they try to provide research-based strategies for staff, students, and parents to help develop a balanced child, a well-rounded child, and really engagement and learning. Those are their two kind of focus areas. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to speak with our rep last week um, and mention all the things that we were doing. He was very excited about some of the stuff that we already have in place, but always there's room for, for growth, there's room for improvement, right? Um, so they're going to come in, they're going to form a team of, of, of parents, students, and teachers at the high school. It's going to be about 10 to 12 people. That's going to be our in-house challenge success team. We're going to work with the challenge success rep that we have. They come and do two parent presentations throughout the course of the year, one in November, one in March. In between those dates is going to be a survey that we send out to parents, students, and staff to get their feedback about, is there anything that we're doing that we're not even aware of that's causing student stress? Could we look at our homework policies? Can we look at our schedule? I know we talked a little bit about exploring a flex block idea. That might be something that we get we talk about with challenge success. Is that a good idea? If so, why and how will it look? So those are some things that, that we're excited about. Their big tagline, which I think uh, fits right into what Ms. Parson said earlier, is as a school district, you have to kind of broaden your definition of success. Not every student is has the 4.0 GPA and goes off to a four-year college. And we need to be able to embrace all of the students that we have in front of us. And so. Um, I'm really excited for the work. I know that uh, I'm pretty close with the Medfield High School principal and the Dover Sherborne High School principal, and they both are going through the process with Challenge Success, and they rave about some of the things that they've been able to do with this group. Um, one school case, uh, set up an assessment calendar, so teachers will put up kind of when they're going to give their assessment, so kids can have a good idea of when that's going to be, and then teachers might look at it and say, that seems like a lot of assessments on Thursday for this. Let's, let's move things around. So anything we can do to make the experience better for the students when it comes to social-emotional learning. So. Um, other thing that I wanted to quickly touch upon, um, <clears throat> and Alan mentioned it as well, uh, kind of the diversity inclusion uh, discussion. That's something that we're very passionate about at the high school and, and doing everything we can to make sure that every student feels comfortable. Um, we have, um, you know, I wouldn't say we're done with our curriculum work. I know that's been a two-year goal for us. I've come here and talked about that before. Um, we have finished our stage one work for the most part. A few more groups have to put that up uh, and get finished with that before December. Um, and it's something you're always going to revisit. It's not like done the curriculum work, but now it gives us the opportunity to kind of have that opportunity where it says with the windows and mirrors conversation that, that, that Mr. Keller talked about before, and also where some of the social-emotional learning stuff fits in. Um, we are excited. We, we, um, <clears throat> at one of the conferences that we went to, we, we, we uh, found out a school that uh, asks students to um, record their name uh, on this software. And so uh, an opportunity for us, uh, our teachers, to kind of get to know the kids a little bit and get to know their names a little bit before they show up on the first day of school. So we actually sent the information out to the freshman class, and, and a good portion of the kids have recorded their names. And I think it's an, a nice opportunity uh, for staff to kind of um, hear the students say their name uh, and be able to, to, to be able to greet them and get to know them a little bit before they come in for the first day of school. So that's just kind of on the umbrella of social emotional learning too. So I know that goes in a lot of different directions. Um, and then our, our final goal, <clears throat> and uh, I thought Dr. Cavanaugh did a really nice job opening up here today to talk a little bit about the uh, enrollment growth. This is nothing new to anybody, uh, but this came out loud and clear in the NEASC feedback that this is something you need to be really mindful of and keep at the top of your priority list. If you want to continue to be a top tier high school um, and talk about the different accolades that we get at the high school, you need to make sure you have the space um, and the physical plant for it. And I think um, right now, thanks to your help, we've, we've, we've done a pretty good job of providing the, the, the appropriate amount of staff for our kids. Uh, right now, based on the kids who moved in, I feel like we had 62 students come into the high school, 31 actually moved out of the district or went to Keefe Tech and other things. So that was about a 31 student increase. Um, and then we have about eight more students that are pending now. So, um, you know, we're up around 1240, which is certainly the largest 
uh, number we've ever had at the high school. But I do feel our class sizes are okay at this point. We're in that kind of mid-20 range. Uh, a little bit lower for our, our college prep classes, maybe a little higher for our honors classes. It's the space that Dr. Cavanaugh mentioned. Uh, we often have English classes in a biology lab or biology in a, in a foreign language class. So that's, that is almost becoming a little bit normal, mm -hmm. unfortunately, at high school. So if we had the ability, I know uh, Ms. Rothnick's working really hard with the architect, and if we had a few more classrooms, it would certainly um, be beneficial, that's for sure. But if we continue to get more numbers, you know, those class sizes will increase. But, um, and we're going to continue to do the studies and, and, and um, address kind of where we are with class sizes. Um, you know, and, and I think right now, when you look at those numbers that were presented up here earlier, we have the largest school that we're going to have now, but next year, the incoming eighth grade, for now, is a little bit smaller, 50 students than the graduating seniors. I know. So you never know what's going to happen, right? But um, those are things we're going to continue to kind of uh, just keep uh, at, at the forefront and make decisions based on, on, on size and space. So those are, I mean, we have a lot of different things that we focus on every year, but these are the three main things for, for the high school school improvement plan. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Anybody like want to jump in? Yeah. Um, I just had a comment. Uh, I'm thinking about goals two and three and how they're actually linked. That I would imagine these larger and larger classrooms lend themselves to anxiety making environments for yeah. the kids. So I'm glad that the SEL is being tackled more overtly yep. and explicitly with the kids. Absolutely. Yep. Needs to. Yeah. Yeah. I love all this. It's all great. Um, the only thing I wanted to, you know, sort of highlight, um, and I'm really glad you're looking at it for the social emotional piece, is the um, sort of the self advocacy component for students. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like the kids I know who are recent graduates, who are in college, academically, not a problem. They're ready. They're you know they know mm -hmm. what they're doing. Where kids seem to be struggling, and this continues in college. And I'm sure you see it as well. Is who am I and where am I going and how do I get there? Yeah. And there's so much that kids can do. There's so many extracurriculars, there are so many clubs, there are so many careers. How do I create a plan? Like mm -hmm. that individual kind of success thing. How, how can we um, help students um, sort of block out the noise and hear their own passion and figure out how to move forward? Yeah, and I think, that's a good question. Um, yeah. you know, there are lots of other causes of stress, but the one thing that I kind of hear among my kids I know who are in the 20s is that it's just challenging to find your way because there is so much you can do. Sure. And I think it's you get sort of paralyzed in some cases. So, yeah. And I, I love anything that we can do through, um, you know, defining, you know, who we're trying to be, you know, the vision of a graduate or working with guidance yep. to help students when we're talking to our guidance counselors, have those conversations about, you know, what are you doing after school? Like, either pare it down or beef it up. Like, I think mm -hmm. both things have to happen. Sure. You know, some kids yeah. aren't maybe knowing how to engage at all, and other kids are, like, overextended beyond. And, and right. when you stop and ask them, you know, why are you doing those 16 clubs? They have no idea. Like, there's one <clears> they, they really like they care to. about, and the mm -hmm. other 15 are like, oh, it looks good on a resume. Sure. Yeah. And I think the, the counseling around paring down and focusing or being brave enough to engage anything that we can do there. Yeah, that's, those are, that's a great point. Um, and, and yeah, I think uh, you know that we've added a guidance counselor to our, mm -hmm. our staff. So that's going to help the numbers going to come down. So there might be some more opportunity for those conversations. And I think a big part of what Challenge Success brings to the table is they offer that support for parents as well. Because I don't think it's just a, let's yeah. talk to the student about these options. It's a, it's a, it's a larger conversation Absolutely. than that. Um, and, and I forgot to mention this before. And, and Mr. Keller mentioned it with Mr. Vera. We are exploring ways to try to have a speaker series for our students, uh, where we have some people that are, you know, maybe a lawyer, a doctor, or a, or an engineer can come in, and, and kids can sign up like they sign up if, let's just say, Syracuse University comes to see the high school, to hear from people in, the, in, in a different profession. And so uh, that could fit in the flex block that we might get to, but even before that, we could find ways to, to, for students to kind of hear about different professions. Because I sent a survey out last year to graduates of the prior two years. And the feedback that I got back most was there needs to be a little bit more mental health awareness and curriculum within the high school, in that we do a great job preparing kids for school and for college, but not necessarily for what's after college in the workforce. And so, you know, obviously we're doing some work with our mental health curriculum, some people in our wellness department, 
And I think that speaker series can kind of accomplish some of that for students to get a sense of what else is out there, not just planning for college. I just wanted to say I really liked Amanda's point about the students being kind of overwhelmed with too many options. There's that consumer paralysis which afflicts us all in this mightily capitalist society that we live in. Um, but I wonder if there are ways to introduce more time into their lives for quiet. I mean, there are lots of talks you can offer and extracurricular options, mm -hmm. but I think it's turning things down a bit to, yeah. uh, this is just a broader philosophical statement. It's yeah. not a critique. It's mm -hmm. just a thought. That yeah. There's just too much going on. It overwhelms me. And if I were a 16-year-old, I would be triply overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like choices of courses, too, are almost endless and extracurricular activities. And you feel as if with every choice you make, you're condemning yourself <laughs> to a narrow pathway to follow. Yeah. Yeah, and I think when we talk a little bit about the scheduling work that we're doing, uh, the, flex uh, the flex block serves in that way uh, for a lot of schools where it's not necessarily downtime, but it can be downtime depending on what the kid has going on and, um, as opposed to telling someone, oh, you got to cut this activity or not do this because the day is so packed with things. So if you give them some opportunity during the day, it might, it might help. Um, but it's a challenge, and I think it's, it's, it's not just us. Uh, a lot of communities certainly are, are, are dealing with this. Society as a whole. Society as a whole, yeah. But you've heard a lot of good building to, blocks in place. Yeah, yeah, certainly, yeah. Well, and, and your, exactly, and your point to the, your first goal that connects to that really nicely, too, and just thinking about how the, you know, a kid who graduates from Hopkinton is able to sort of think about where he or she wants to, to go and what, and, and, and that might change in your 20s. It doesn't mean, I mean, there's quite a few of us around this table who are case in point of how that may change. But um, I think... You know, just being thoughtful and, and mindful of the fact that what you try the first time and you stick with for two years may not be what you do for the rest of your life, so don't worry about it. And mm -hmm. So I think that yeah. all comes together in sort of what you're looking for with it, someone who graduates, yeah. which, you know, yeah. is all-encompassing. I like that. It's a great idea. So I, I love the goals across the board. <clears throat> I, it, I really like how, just in this has been true I, every year that I have known you, you really you dive in with some of the social and emotional thing and you always are looking to see what can you do better and taking from the NEOSC stuff it kind of to it seems like even a, a higher level in a more rapid way than I would have expected necessarily so I appreciate that thank, thank you. you I also I really um, I like the whole thing of having the ninth graders record their name. I, mm -hmm. That's a great idea. It's actually, we're going to put it up to all students, too. Yeah, okay. But we started that's, with the ninth grade, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, Do you that's a great idea. recordings? Yeah. That was uh, the first thing that led. <laughs> one so far, okay, but for the most part, it's been very good. <laughs> I, I hadn't thought that. The first thing that popped into my head, maybe that says something about <laughs> me. I don't know. Reinvented myself several times. No, but I think that's really cool, too. I agree. Just the opportunity for a, it. To be culturally sensitive yep. and to allow kids to, to own their identity and who, how, how they're called, what they're called. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, and, and I think back to circle what I said earlier was I really, I so appreciate the uh, benefit of having had such a stable team of principals and having oh, yes. watched all of you work together and being able to align from all the way from Marathon up through where you are. Mm -hmm. It's stronger every year and I think part of that is who you are individually but how you've work together has just grown and blossomed. So thank you all. You now, everybody. Thank you for having us. Yeah. If I may, uh, of course. Mr. Bishop, um, I'm very excited to see your goals as well. Clearly, a lot of thought has gone in. Um, and just listening to you today, it seems you're not resting on your laurels. It looks like you're continuing to explore ways to be better, to do things for the students, keeping them at the center of all the work that you do. Just listening to you, just touch upon all the areas that you're looking at, whether it is the speaker series, listening to folks outside. Uh, you talked about collaborating with other districts like Medfield. Um, you know, that's very, very exciting to hear that you're going to continue to keep um, the standards up high uh, so very, very thankful for that. And I want to uh, also say that in all the work that I've seen through all of the sets that each one of you have presented, somehow to me at the back of it, uh, I also see Dr. Kavanaugh and Ms. Parsons' work there, although they haven't spoken much. So I'm very thankful 
to them and all five of you. Thank you Thank and you. wishing you the very best for this school year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. So that we're going to circle back now to the end. Do we want to take, a, take a five-minute break? Yeah. Is that all right? Let's take a five-minute break. Otherwise, we're all going to be getting a five-minute break. I need to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my idea was to do this, and then I was going to walk. Thank you. 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 Thank
we'll circle back to new business item B, which is where we started jumping out of order, which was the Elmwood uh, school gift account. Okay, so the Martell family has graciously donated $1,000 to the Elmwood School for the library. And I will just read you a little excerpt from the Martell family letter. As you know, the Elmwood Library and all the staff at Elmwood, past and present, were dear to Cindy. She absolutely loved her time working at Elmwood. We are grateful for the caring and respect you have shown, Cindy. It's a comfort to our family to know how important she was to all of you. Please extend our heartfelt thanks to all of your staff. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking for you to accept a $1,000 gift for the Elmwood School from the Martell family. I'm moved to accept. I'll second. A motion Very by Meg. Good. A second. We'll do a roll call starting with Amanda. Aye. Aye. Mina? Aye. Yes. And I am also a yes, so that is um, very yes. graciously uh, accepted. Different views. Very thanks to yes. the Martell family. Lovely. So then we can go ahead, since we did the policy revisions already, to the student handbook revisions. And Ms. Parson for that. Yes, this is essentially um, a very simple request um, based upon the recommendation of our attorney, Paige Tobin. And there is language in Mass General Law that does allow schools to transfer student records to receiving schools even without parental consent. And that would not be a practice that we would normally undertake. We would always um, want to obviously get parental consent before transferring records. But there are some cases where we aren't able to receive parental consent. Either they've moved and we weren't aware it was happening or something happens very quickly. And then all of a sudden we receive a request from a receiving school asking for the student record so they can make appropriate plans for student entrance. So the way that you're able to do this is by informing families ahead of time that this is a practice that you undertake as a district. So what we are looking to do is add language into our school handbooks in the student records section stating that um, per Mass General Law and given the fact that we always do seek parental consent for transfer of records whenever humanly possible, that you should be aware that we will, um, in certain cases, transfer records without a signed form um, if we didn't receive it and parental consent on the handbook, knowing that they have seen the handbook and read the handbook, uh, and that language is in there, covers us legally to be able to do that. Um, so the request would be um, for the committee to agree to add this language into the school handbooks. Great. I move to add the language. I'll second. Motion by May, second by Jen. Amanda, you want to roll call? Aye. Aye. Mina? Aye. Yes. And I am a yes, so that passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, that brings us down into the gift for the White House renovation. Yes, it should be very quick. Um, I'm let Alexis Miller was gracious enough to donate a dishwasher to our White House renovation, and so I am asking um, that you, as a committee, accept that gift. I move to accept it. Mm. I'll second. Second. Very nice. Do a roll call. Aye. Aye. Mina? Aye. Yes. And I am also a yes, so that is... So accepted, and that brings us down into the time, uh, FY21 timeline for the budget discussion, right? I didn't skip any. Oops, no, you're good. Let's forget about that. Should have an under the table kit or something when I miss something. Um, so I will also ask Mrs. Rothenbeck to jump in because she's really, really the person who uh, drafted this budget timeline, and she does a fabulous job of keeping us on track every single year. Uh, we did have an opportunity to meet with Tim O'Leary, who is the town's CEO, CFO, and uh, so I'll just have her tell you a little bit about um, this timeline and our meeting with him. Yeah, so um, thank you. Uh, basically, we look to um, follow the town charter, of course, in terms of the timeline of really what is that end result. And according to the charter, it is to get a budget package to the town manager by February 1st. So to a degree, we work backwards. Um, and as you can see, it is a very long process in order to engage with all the departments, give them adequate time to uh, prepare their budgets, then have internal meetings uh, with us. Um, and go through and really uh, see where we are at the end. We will be having a joint meeting. Um, I had originally put a date on and, and took that off. Um, that was just an error. So there will be a joint meeting at some point where 
we will hear from the Board of Selectmen and the Town Manager in terms of what they consider the budget guidance. Um, so that will be coming soon, and then that will then feed into our process in terms of the budget development. In addition, uh, you see there's an overlay of the capital budget, which also happens fairly early, um, basically also to allow time for hearings, both with the CPC and the CIC, and then for it to be folded in with the town's capital plan, also to be all put together in January with both the operating budget and the capital. Um, so the meetings that involve the school committee will follow the school committee calendar once that has been um, defined. As you remember, November 28th is Thanksgiving, so that date will change. Are, you, are we not that committed to this? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Yes. <laughs> So this, again, it's just a draft. It's for your information, just to put your eyes on it and see what the process is. You'll have in your head when some of these things will be coming to your school committee meetings in the future. Um, but that's really what this is. And, and again, it's it's a draft. That's great. Can I make a comment? Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I make, I feel like this comes back to us every year in this sort of thing where it feels like it gets pushed up a little bit, that the superintendent's budget recommendation I see is slated to be in December and the public hearing is on January 2nd uh, I don't know how firm they are in terms of moving uh, things back to having that done in December but I would prefer to have the superintendent's budget recommendation in January for a couple of reason, reasons one is December is such a packed month um, I, it feels like it could get lost in there for the public following along uh, and it and also requires that we have meetings every week in December. Yes, it does. Uh, it, and the other thing is it puts the public hearing immediately after vacation, which I know our public hearings are traditionally not high um, volume for the public, but I do like the idea of making it more accessible by being able to promote it more ahead of time. And I think if it, we're having to promote it over the holiday, it's not going to get... My preference would be to push the whole thing out one week. I don't know how they... I 100% support okay. everything yeah. you just said. Me too. I'm with you. I think that making yeah. it earlier, I know every year Sorry. they make that request, but uh, I think that it, it just does not make sense to push the guesswork that you put into a, a budget the next fiscal year, even a month earlier. I mean, I feel like it should even be in March, but I know that, I, you know, logistically that can't happen. But, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. with you 100%. So. Dr. Kevin, a uh, question for you. Last year, I, one of the things that I found uh, very well done was the entire budget process. I thought it was done very smoothly in a very timely manner. Was there any reason shared as to why uh, it needs to be moved up, pushed in or you know, brought in? Well, I think, and, and Susan, you can sort of help me with the answer, but I think that, you know, they are looking at so many town departments that they have to have all of those budget hearings and presentations that I think that their concern is that uh, they have to get a town meeting warrant put together and town meeting is that first week of May. So, you know, for them, they feel like they're also on a fast track. And because we have the lion's share of the budget, it might be easier for them if, if we were a little sooner in the process but I see. so and, and uh, just to just to clarify they actually wanted a school committee vote in december mm -hmm. so what you see yeah. before you does not reflect at all what the town wanted um because when we did the draft um dr cavanelli and i looked at the draft of moving it to a december both a public hearing and school committee vote it made it very difficult for the departments to develop a budget when it's very different for us because staff are not in school during right. the summer. Right. So they would not have that time, whereas town departments are year round. They, they have, it, it looks different. Um, so for us to move up to a, a December school committee vote uh, seemed unrealistic. So this draft does not reflect what the town wished for us to do. I see. Uh, Ms. Rothermick, this is something I also shared uh, with Dr. Cavanaugh during one of our calls, is, uh, you know, we have, we are facing this unprecedented growth 
right? This is not a gradual growth, such a rapid growth. And when I look at the initial timelines when all the budgets are being prepared, we're talking about August, September, right? That's the time frame when we are opening the schools, you know, looking at all the kids, teachers are getting ready, principals are looking at the schools, uh, we are looking at transportation, so many things. I mean, for the school year to start and settle down, it's almost, you know, it takes a month, month and a half, I would think. So I'm, you know, I'm a little concerned of putting this additional pressure of, you know, now we have to prepare, right? I would imagine when you're building the budget ground up, there is so much effort that goes in and so many people involved. Um, so um, I don't know if uh, starting this process this early is even feasible. The, the, the process that you see before you mirrors what we did last year. Off it's by just a week. the end. It's, it's the end. It's, that's the end. it's, it's that's really hard. only the public hearing. So last year, it's that last week. But so my recollection was the superintendent's budget recommendation was the week before the public hearing. That is correct. I think that's true. Yes, I think that's true. Yeah. So yes. it was the one special meeting that has been added in here. The one special meeting in December is the only real difference between last year. December 12th is the additional date that we put in. So so are you saying that the process will was actually started? I, my recollection is it started in September. If you the look, initial meetings and the meetings with you know the joint discussions where um, the budget message was given that all got initiated in September is my recollection. That's correct, but we had already began the process at the school department. Okay, so you are comfortable with the upfront work then? the dates of all of that? For the, the departments to develop their budgets mid-September to mid-October is the same as last year. I see, so all we are talking about then is just those um, three or four dates in December and January, is that right? Yeah. The one thing that's been added, Mina, is the December 12th date. Okay. The thing that, that um, concerned me the most um, looking at this, well, thank you for putting it together. <laughs> I mean, it's clear, it'd be nice to see it all like this um, laid out, but I'm concerned about the capital budget um, just because of the, the timing of the capacity study mm -hmm. output. And um, we've heard from all of our principals now that, you know, space is, is clearly an issue and whether it ends up being um, classrooms at Hopkins or because of the third grade, size of third grade or um, additions onto the high school or whatever. I feel like to, for us to sit down in September on the 19th and hear the capital plan and then vote on it um, a month later, I'm just feeling uncomfortable with that piece. Can we shift the capital piece a little bit? I mean, I know that there are other hearings and whatnot, but I mean, we are a huge part of the town budget and we just, we need to get a reasonable picture of what we're budgeting for. I mean, we can, we could cast a wide net and ask for a lot of things <laughs> and hope that it all goes through. But I mean, to get a really accurate view of what we really need for next year, I just so want to make sure we have the inputs. In, in terms of the capital plan, you'll review it September 19th, but you will not approve it until October 17th. So it gives you a month to somewhat digest it, but then it is due to the town manager um, November 15th. Has the so capacity? again, it's, it's working backwards from their deadline and using the school committee meetings. Has the capacity study started yet? No, the capacity study timeline, um, the proposals are due August 26th. Mr. Rothmay, uh, at the bottom of the dates, there is a 2.5% and a 1.8 free cash. Yeah, What's, what so is that about? Again, that was during our meeting, I was just jotting my own notes. So that actually was re-uploaded with a clean, and so that's... That's not relevant to the committee, so I apologize for that. Okay. 
I guess I'm I'm just looking at the packet um, that was on the shared drive. That's what I've been. That's correct. At. No, yeah. I know. I I uploaded it with my own notes. I didn't realize okay. they were there. Okay. I'm I'm just wondering that if that's still the one everyone's looking at. I'm yeah, looking it's at it too. too. But yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. The, the okay, dates are great. accurate, right? So I, I guess now, just to be clear, because this wasn't clear to me earlier, is that the dates that we are, you know, shifting is bringing the school committee vote in, adding an additional date of December 12th, right, mm -hmm. and bringing the, uh, uh, the public hearing in as well. Is that right? The public hearing is a week earlier it, than it yes, was last year. Right, it's a week earlier. Yeah. Is that the effective change? That's correct. It, it is, but I, I from this, but I continue to object to that just because I feel concerned with how people in December are not necessarily following as closely for to get the superintendent's budget recommendation, and I feel like it's a week, and I I want to be cognizant of the town sides timeline but i also feel like it loses the ability to engage as meaningfully with the public and for them even if they don't come to feel like they have had that opportunity so the proposal could be to eliminate that special meeting for december 12th yep move the elementary principal's presentation to december 19th yep on january 2nd would be the superintendent's budget recommendation you could keep that January 9th special meeting and have that be your public forum. And January 16th would be your vote, unless you are open to having the public forum and school committee vote on the same day. No. I don't want to do that. I, I prefer the putting the vote on the 16th and submitting it on the 17th. Yeah. So is that any different from what was discussed, of what was done last year? That timeline sounds the same as last year, right? I think it is. There, yes, yes, because that would be the only difference. The only okay. suggestion I might make, and it's really just for the elementary principals, I'm wondering how the committee feels about keeping the December 12th date and having the elementary principals present then and eliminating the December 19th date. I don't know sure. how you feel about that. Only because I think we get very close to the holiday when we're on the 19th. And yes. Susan, you can correct me if you think that that's a bad idea for any reason. No, and again, I was just following the school committee yeah. meeting calendar for that December 19th. Right, right, right. So I know that there's that, a... we take that, that content on the 19th, move it to the 2nd, move the hearing to the 9th, and move the vote to the 16th. Did I say that right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As long, I mean, I understand the town side of things, but I also think that we need to be realistic. So I, I, I'm on board with that idea, too. I have, I have one question, Nancy. Uh, yes. I hear you about the uh, public hearing part, mm -hmm. and I do think we must give public uh, not only enough time to absorb what has been discussed, but also be mindful of the holiday time frame, mm -hmm. right? which are things that you have pointed out. Um, I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, what if we had, besides the second, another uh, public hearing giving two opportunities perhaps um, say on the 6th or the 7th of january if it's a possibility again uh, you know for me the first reaction was the pressure on the principals and all the staff to be working on this but as Ms. rathamek is saying that this is you know that part is okay i'm just throwing it out there not that i'm a big fan of continuing to change this timeline every year. I would want it to get be you know, something we agree upon and just fix that timeline, at least for the next um, couple of years, so that we are not in this place every year trying to figure out how do we adjust as or make room for it. Well, this is in response to the town's request to be yeah. to push the schedule up a little bit, right? No, we did not push the schedule oh, we, up didn't at all. You did do it at all. No, okay. this is just the final days, I think. We really okay. made no changes. OK. Yeah. All right. So. I guess my 
I am not a huge fan of that, I guess, because I, my, I, I actually, the second I don't like is a public hearing date still because right. it's, it's, the, it's the first day back from vacation. Sure. Yeah, right. Sure. That's fair. Uh, uh, I'm what not, if it was a little later? I'm not adverse to changing that to a different day of the week if, is, if what you're getting at is trying to consolidate it so that we still get our budget voted on earlier. I can put it on. Put what it day on. is the second? Is that the a second's Thursday? a Thursday, so that so I don't think that really week is good. Well, yeah, right, you that can't, week I is mean, no. To have it on a Friday is. So mm -hmm. and then, if we push off the public hearing, push it back to the following week, we could potentially, from I guess following along from what Mina is saying, put it on the sixth and then vote the budget on the ninth still. But I'm not sure I love that idea either. It's a small window between the public hearing and the vote, and for people to get then any feedback following the public hearing that we're going to consider meaningfully only has a couple of days. Right. You're also altering the day that school committee would normally. It, it's adding an additional day for it, and so. So that people that pay attention to school yeah, committee would not, not expect it. Exactly. Right. Good point. Do you think it's going to be a huge problem to the town if we submit a week later? We've already told them that we cannot abide, that we cannot, that we will be doing a January vote. But but doing voting on the 16th as opposed to the 9th, do you think that's going to be a huge issue? It, it, no. Okay. That, that's what I would be in favor of. Then. Thank you. And I know so, I had looked it up before, but it seems like last year it might have been the E. 5th of February that we went before the Board of Selectmen. So it was immediately after our, so mm -hmm. they do get us out of the way pretty quickly. Right. Yeah, I guess I'm in favor of that too then. If we have the hearing the 9th, the vote the 16th, that gives us a week and everybody else a week to um, think about whatever might come up on the 9th. Does that make sense? And when will the elementary principals present now? The second of December. Yeah, they're on the twelfth of December. We Are were talking right about that? we were talking about keeping that twelfth as we it, we have to go back when we discuss yeah. the school committee meeting dates, I guess, and mm -hmm. discuss mm -hmm. eliminating the nineteenth in favor of the twelfth. Okay, I think that's fair. As long as the principals are, I mean, that seems so soon, even though it's only August. I think that sounds good. Right? It's crazy that all of a sudden we're talking about December being soon. Yeah. But, if, I mean, if that's what they're used to, and they're... So, um, again, Ms. Rodwick, you're saying that a school committee vote on January 16th would be okay? Yes. So, same as last year. That would okay. be acceptable uh, yes. with the town? Yes. Okay. So okay. They, they understand our constraints. Okay. Okay. So, that's great. Let's do it. Can we go All back right. to the capital question? Right. So when oh, do, sorry. when, like, if we have to deliver our capital budget um, mid-November, second week of November, mm -hmm. um, is there any meaningful shift that would allow us to encompass the output of the growth study in our work? Like, do we have a sense of the timing of when that and when we'll be seeing some output and indicators? I mean, is it just going to be a miss, or is it possible for us to include that output in our planning? We'll have an interim report by October 25th. Okay. Um, so even if we could shift a week or so, you know, I, I just would like to hear what, I mean, I, I can think of a million ways that we need to spend capital money right now, but we're going to have to prioritize, so I'd like to hear from, uh, and I think the community would like to hear from a third party. You know, we all have our ideas about what, where the where the biggest pinch is right now. But I think hearing from a reputable third party on what our highest priorities are would help in our planning. So if even if we could get that interim out, um, output from the study, I would feel a little bit more comfortable voting the capital plan on November fourteenth. Um, as a for instance. As a for instance, sure. Yeah. We have a, there's a big gap between the 17th and the 14th. I feel like we must have other meetings 
We do have the thirty first. I don't think that there's one on the thirty first, is there? Halloween. Yeah, because I think mm -hmm. the lot of candy kid there. factor plays in, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but I I agree with you, Amanda. I feel like especially if we are in the crunch for space, if we get another thirty kids by December. We're going to be mm. in a big crunch for space, and we're going to need to make some pretty significant capital requests. But is there, Susan, is there a way to, I mean, they're not, the, you know, the town is not unaware of our situation. So is there a way to submit a capital budget with some, I, I, I don't, is there a way to say, here's our capital budget, but we're waiting on information from this and this and this in order to address I, I don't think that the capacity plan is going to come up with anything that we're not already looking at. Right. So okay. we already know. So as a for instance, we're already looking at the six classrooms at the high school. Okay. We're already discussing portable classrooms at Hopkins. So I don't think there's going to be an aha uh -huh that we didn't think about right. that we wouldn't be putting into the capital plan. Right. The capacity study is just reinforcing what we already know, essentially, that we got a lot of kids and not enough places for them. And maybe some interim measures you, you yeah. know so I, again from there's going to be also a capacity to fund mm -hmm. in terms in of, their study right. of well in, in terms of what we're going to be asking for in the capital plan um, so I think knowing that we're having the senior study for Elmwood we would be looking for the feasibility study to be part of this capital plan so we'll be looking so for some very large dollar amounts um, in terms of what we need to address the growth at all the buildings. And that would be included in the proposed capital budget in November. Absolutely. Regardless of what what studies have been or have not been conducted. Okay. That's correct. All right, the so thing, that addresses that. The only thing about having, um, having an opportunity con to consider the output, um, assuming that the studying a consultant will see what we see is that it is a third party and there are a lot of voters in town who don't who don't have kids who don't know what we know because they just aren't that close and I think there, there are often questions about you know why we need to invest so heavily in such a large percentage of our money capital and, and expense wise in the schools and I think it's we're very close to it but there are a lot of voters who aren't so the more we can um, bring on board other assessments of what we need to do and you know, sort of third party neutral perspectives. I think it will just help people really understand what we live every day. So when we go and do our capital hearings, yeah. which is later, yeah. is when we submit all of our backup. Okay. okay. So the actual okay. submission of the plan does not have to have all the backup. Okay. So, but we need to give the town yeah. an idea of what all the department's needs are when I say department, school, police, fire, everybody yeah. put together. And then when we are going for those um, hearings is when we're giving them estimates and, and all the backup. And then even when you get to town meeting, you probably have more backup. Yeah. Okay. So there's plenty of time to develop the, okay. the third party and all the additional information that we need for the request. If we're submitting on the f November 15th, can we vote it on November 14th? Or is that just packing too much into the, because that would buy right. a little bit right. of time. Just, will it be time. done, and so we vote it, you send it, or is there more work that would have to happen in that 24-hour window that's prohibitive? Well, let's put it this way. If, if on November 14th, you vote to make all these changes. Okay, that's a that okay. Would, that, would be, that, that would be a lot of work. <laughs> yes, okay. 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 that would be an issue. Now I okay. get that piece. Um, but hopefully, if we're reviewing it, that would not be the case. Okay. So, could, is there a, sorry, could we review it then on the earlier date? Uh, and if there are changes that need to be made at that point, just bring it back on the 14th for a final piece. So would that make it feel better October? to you? 17. Yeah, and if, if we feel comfortable approving it, approving it then. Um, right. But then having flexibility yeah. if there are concerns to make sure that we vote it by the 14th so we can commit to the town, they'll have it the 15th. But being aware that we don't want to be making big changes on the 14th, so if we have big changes, we'll be. Do it before that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. I'd like to leave open the possibility that we 
chose to invest in a capacity study because we felt the need to have mm -hmm. eyes on. So I think there's, mm -hmm. we don't, we can't anticipate all the output. So I'd like to, I feel better doing it that way, just so we can even prioritize our own votes. And um, Dr. Kavanaugh, I want to throw in another thing. You know, in the past, we have looked at NESTEC findings and NESTEC projections for the year ahead. And uh, my understanding is this year, we're not looking to NESTEC for projections. Is that accurate? That's correct. I think NESDEC is maybe $7,000, and we thought if we're paying for a capacity study, why would we also pay for NESDEC? Um, so having said that, it makes it even more important to have the capacity study inputs in, right? And not that NESDEC has really been great at giving us the projections. I'm sorry to be beating them up like this every single year, uh, but that's the reality. I mean, right now, with the projection with all the thorough analytics was at 104. And even at the beginning of the year, we are hitting close to 200. I mean, that's a big input going into the projections, uh, the budget projections. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. So I like the schedule with that one change in January. Mm -hmm. I think that makes good sense. And the change in the capital. Did we change the capital? I think we did. Well, we were going to review it in October on that date to see oh, okay. and then okay. allow yes. us yes. to vote in November okay. so there are big changes. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Do we need to do anything with that or do we just move on? Oh, just yeah, it's not something you vote. We wouldn't vote. Yeah. No. Okay. All right. So that moves us into old business item A, which is the superintendent goals. All right. So they are coming back. Uh, what I've done, you can just take a look in your packet and see anything that is in red font is something that I have added as a result of our conversation last time. Um, so in my second goal, professional pra practice and district improvement combined, um, that's the diversity, sensitivity, equity, inclusivity, all of that. Um, in the, one of the key product benchmarks, I will be adding using the Metro West Health Foundation survey to um, just take a look at some of the data there around students' well-being at the secondary level. And so I think that, you know, it's sometimes hard to look at them from year to year because you're comparing apples to oranges, right? Like the class of 2018 is different mm -hmm. from 19, it's different from 2020. But I do think that we see trends across that data. So that will be at least a little bit helpful. And I hope that your feeling that there is sort of other layers of monitoring there based on what you just saw in the school improvement plans with all the social emotional goals that are there. And I think, you know, one of the challenges Mr. Bishop spoke to is, you know, also kind of figuring out like, is it working, right? Um, and one of the things that we're hearing, not only in this community, but in other communities, that there is that uptick, right? We, we continue to see more and more cases of students with, you know, social, emotional, behavioral needs. So, um, you know, we, we'll keep after it, but I don't necessarily know that we always see the numbers going down. Um, so, you know, you do see some interesting numbers. So while vaping is going up, cigarette smoking is going down, while marijuana use is going up, alcohol use is going down. So you just sort of see those kinds of trends. But um, we'll also be able to look at some of the social emotional answers that kids are giving to us. In uh, goal number three, growing communication between families um, and the superintendent and growing relationships with elected officials. I did make a couple of changes there in the key product benchmark. Uh, I reduced that number of blog posts to 30. Uh, and I know that someone at the table had said that they thought that that would be an awful lot. And the more I thought about it, I thought, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Uh, number four, uh, producing a minimum of seven published communications with residents or families about the enrollment growth and its impacts uh, on the budget process. Mm -hmm. I like what you were just talking about with the capacity study. And I think when we began work on the strategic objectives, and this goes all the way back to maybe a year ago in March, it was Josh Hanna at the high school who said, you know, having grown up in Hopkinton and worked in Hopkinton for such a significant amount of time, he feels like people are very comfortable with things if they have the knowledge base. And so I feel like this is an important key um, product benchmark as well. And um, then uh, sharing out school school committee decisions with the community and also what's on our agenda. So we did send that out. 
it's all being a day early. <laughs> and then we resent it because we had a little problem with the dates. But we've ironed that out, and uh, and I think that that's just a good practice for us going forward. That's great. Yeah, that's great. I yeah. love. It. I, I also I love blog posts. Mm. I well, really those yes. have been great. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also I did catch the email both times. I did not catch that there was a date issue. Oh. Well, right. maybe it's right in our heads. So. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> For you, you already have it in, trouble in your mind. For anybody watching, they should definitely mm -hmm. um, read Dr. Kavanaugh's blog posts, yeah. which are on the front page of the yeah. website, yes. accessible on the um, in the area about like around the hill. Where's... News from the hill. News from the hill. News from yes. the hill. Yes, they're 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 excellent. Yes, my next one, which should be going up this afternoon, is about their vocabulary goal. Oh, because right. I just awesome. think it's so wonderful. Oh, yeah. yes. I'm thrilled with Qu that. Quick question, just the yeah. school committee decisions with the community, is that going to be like the actions taken thing that the board, of, the select board does, or is that something different? No, that would be that like same. what the select board that. does. I love that, yeah. yep. Um, and then finally, in the fourth goal, launching initiatives that build innovative learning opportunities for students. Number five, uh, starting in September, work with the assistant superintendent and secondary principals to increase social emotional um, learning and behavior programs, and then student voice and choice opportunities and grant funded CVTE options. Um, and Mrs. Parson was talking before about career technology education, but I like throwing in the V for vocational as well. Uh, and then number five, under key product benchmark curriculum program documents that will serve um, as evidence of this goal. So I just thought that if we are creating you know, curriculum and programs that that would be sort of an easy way also to show that we are meeting these, this particular goal. And those are the only changes. So, thank you. Thank you. Comments, questions. It's very, very exciting good. about the blog. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's yeah. very well written too. I well, enjoy the. Of course, not a surprise, right. but of course, not a surprise. No, but it's no. enjoyable. It to be a little voicey. I, I, I this like one it. might be a little heavier. <laughs> it's good for thought. So. It's a conversation starter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. I really, you know, I, yeah. So I guess then we are looking for a motion, or you are looking for a motion from us to approve this. Yes. So moved. Motion by Meg. I'll second. Second yes. by Jen. Absolutely. We'll do a roll call starting with Amanda. Aye. 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 Yes. And I am a yes as well. Great. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Phew. Exciting. Yeah, it is. Check that thank one you. off your list now, too. Wow. Yeah, yes. that's that's right. Right. It's a lot of work. That's a good one. Yeah. That is great. So that brings us down into, um, do we want to, so I, I am aware that Meg needs to go at 1.30. Do we want to push off then the liaison roles so that, or, or I, I'm in the interest of time, but also because if we have that discussion with you not here and there's something you're dying to do or participate in the conversation. I hate to push it off again. Can we do it in four minutes? Or All right. <laughs> Um, so, do. Mina, do you want to start that discussion? Sure. Uh, if I may request that presentation to be pulled up related to the uh, subcommittees, a relook. So, I, no, I saw the goal setting. Right. I did not see in the what they had back there anything related to the liaison roles. We have a spreadsheet. Yeah, we have we, a spreadsheet. Not in this packet, but we do from the before, right? Yeah. It's, in, it's, it's, in in the, it's in the drive. It's in the, it's in the drive. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mean, yeah. Okay, so do, are you all able to see that? Um, so, I shared this last month yeah. um, right. when we had this on the agenda. So for anybody watching, do we have a spreadsheet that lists all of the uh, different liaison roles and some Yeah, I, I haven't recently reshared it, um, but I had shared it last month with Mike, if that's something you're able to pull up. Should I'm just taking me a minute just to go through the drive. I always spell liaison role. Put your eyes in. Um, Putting down extra. Yeah. yeah. And my computer's doing weird things. What I can do is perhaps, uh, Dr. Cameron, do you have access to what gets shown on the screen? No. I do not. Oh. Um, and I don't know if Mike is around and if he has access because I had given him access no. to the drive. So no. is, is that no. something he's able to do? It's, it's this one, copy of liaison X, roles. Yeah, okay, is that the one we're looking at, Mina? 
No, these are slides. Oh, slides. is that a PDF? Slides. Oh, I don't have slides. Um, dear. Could you possibly um, share it quickly again, oh, just as then we could quickly? Do you mean the the subcommittees are relook? I don't have it. Yes, I... that's right. Yeah, it? It, I... it's under S C subcommittees altogether relook on the fifteenth July. S C. Mm -hmm. Let me do a search for a relook. I have SC. a subcommittee. Okay. The name is not right. This one? It's SC. What is no. it then? Okay. SC subcommittees relook. Oops. Oh, it's a PDF. Okay. I'm looking for slides. Okay. Is it from 718 S? Oh, that's a policy, not the yep. In answer to your it. question, can we do this quickly? I think, I think yeah. the answer is okay. no on that. Mind. I think we would be better served bringing that back. Um, and kind of continuing on as we were until we reconfigure. I think is that so. okay? That's fine. Yeah. We don't want to pressure with you. Is that okay, Mina, with you? Yeah, and, uh, you know, again, it's a bit, uh, you know, from a timing perspective, this is something we wanted to get done. And uh, so is Meg looking to head out? She has to head out now that because she had to leave at okay. one thirty. Okay, I do think Meg is also needed because we do need to decide who all is there. So I don't think September 6th is too far. Um, so I guess until then we continue to work on whatever we are working on. Right. right. So I think that's fine. Right. Okay. So that's Thank you, Meg. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then we can jump to uh, the school committee goals. Uh, is that seem like the the logical place to go here. Sure. I think we're probably not going to get everything in it. Yes, you're on track there, Nancy. So, uh, Amanda, do you want to um, open that conversation and lead it, please? Sure. Yep. So we have slides. Up. I don't know how to control them. The don't little things over here. But you don't like two slides. You could just click. That's fine. So uh, Mina and I, after the last meeting, were empowered to work together uh, as a little working group to try to get the ball rolling on school committee goals. So if we could go to the next slide. Well, um, so what we're doing. So does it turn off after or just go to sleep or something? Um, are you able no, to turn um, um, the laptop? Oh, sure. Do you want to see the screen? Yeah, there we go. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, 25 slides. Yeah. I just wonder if there's a battery issue at this point. I wonder if HCAM can advance the slide. I'll go ask them. So um, what we're doing today is just introducing the topic and starting the conversation. So nothing about today is intended to be um, official I and mean, this is just a conversation starter so I'm just gonna wait for the slide for a second nope it's moving <laughs> <laughs> we've just gone back in time <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. as much as I enjoy your report it's Groundhog Day we don't want to see that a lot of data again <laughs> no, I was trying to forget it and you brought it back I know. Do you want me just to? Well, we just. I do have it right in front of me. If, I know. Um, yeah. That, while they're resolving it, do you want okay. to talk a little bit? Okay. So the first slide is there, and only three, two with content. Why are we setting goals? We don't. This is not something that we have been um, traditionally officially doing. Um, I think we have focused our efforts in various ways, but. Um, it was recommended at the MASC conference last year that most school, many school committees, if not most, do set goals. Um, school committees tend to align their goals, ideally, with the district strategic priorities and so forth. So um, we are starting out with the idea that this is something that we should be doing as a best practice. Um, I highlighted some um, key words here. Um, the, the reason is to focus our discretionary school committee efforts in support of key strategic priorities to deliver improved results to the community. So um, focus because this is sort of in a way above and beyond our charter which is mm -hmm. approve the budget, oversee the um, superintendent and review the superintendent and handle policy. We do a lot of other things. We're on subcommittees, etc. and we can try to use the goals as an opportunity to focus this extra effort which is where the discretionary comes in. 
Um, we don't always have to do things um, like for last year we, we spawned the website subcommittee. So that was a large subcommittee. It was a choice of ours. It was sort of discretionary that we thought that needed to be done. But the goals will help us channel our efforts into specific strategic areas. Thank you. Um, I mentioned supporting key strategic priorities. Of course, we just have those um, out fresh from Dr. Kavanaugh for this year, and we want to support those. And ultimately, of course, we are trying to improve our results to the community, whether it's improving our transparency and how we do our jobs or improving the ways that we support what the district is doing. Does it make sense why we'd even want to do this? Oh, absolutely. Okay. That's a great. <laughs> Don't want to handle it. If I, if I may add, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, was a result of the self-assessment discussion, uh, we also talked about holding ourselves, uh, you know, more accountable uh, in a more formal way. Not that this hasn't been done in the past. Uh, I think uh, we have all held to, you know, we know what our purview is, what our role is, and we continue to do that. But as Amanda mentioned, it's a best practice, and it brings, uh, it clarifies what is our focus for the year ahead, and we all are committed to it and hold ourselves accountable through a review of the goals and measuring how we have done with the goals that we set forth for the year. So the next slide talks about parameters for goals as we're thinking about what our goals might be. Um, Mina had shared, I think at our last meeting, a handout on what a SMART goal would be. It's a common acronym, but um, uh, we try to keep SMART in mind, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time bound um, uh, when we were thinking about what we could potentially use as goals. Um, to be achievable, it must fall within the purview of school committee, so it has to be, you know, within our charter and nothing really operational or, or getting involved in what the district is doing. Um, it must be in support of the uh, identified long, medium, and short-term priorities, and as we mentioned, we have the strategic plan. Oh, Jen's, Jen's back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and the current year uh, school improvement plans we just heard. It must pr provide a benefit to the students and or the community. There's going to be a reason why we're doing this. And enhance or streamline our operations. Those were the parameters that we had in mind, Mina and I, as we were trying to sort of brainstorm where could we start with this conversation. Does anybody have any questions or questions? concerns or additions or anything about the parameters? It's kind of bread and butter. I have, I have a, a question, I guess, that yeah. something just jumped out at me. So if it's going to focus our discretionary efforts to be achievable, it has to fall under our purview. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a little bit of a paradox? Well, <laughs> I, think, I, think I think you can take, um, well, Mike, it might come to light as we talk about some of the ones that we brainstormed as a starting point, but I think, take the website subcommittee. Right. Um, it kind of fell out of our purview of approving a budget item to do the website, and we felt like, you know, to see that goal come to fruition in a way that would optimally benefit everybody and to provide the support to the district that we wanted, a subcommittee made sense. So that work happened, it could have happened without a subcommittee. But I think by making it a subcommittee-driven um, activity, it improved the transparency. Um, maybe for the community, there were more report outs, open meetings, and so forth. It, it, I think it fits some of these other parameters. So um, I don't know. I think as we talk about specific goals that we might consider, we can obviously want to make sure that, that they make sense. I don't think that's a conflict, but maybe I'm wrong. I think potentially to the conflict. I mean, to look at kind of the difference between discretionary versus a. I think it would depend on when we get it. it maybe it would be an easy conversation, easier conversation to be more specific once we get into the next right. part. That's yeah. what I'm thinking too. Okay. When we get to the specifics, it, rather than yep. Um, so, so again, today is the beginning of the conversation, and the goal the goal is that we would um, individually share goals that we might want to have considered. Again, Mina and I started with a list, um, just kind of brainstorming, and we're going to go through that now. But 
it we want to pick maybe three to five at most we're talking you know, we have a list of about 11 or 12 to think about but we as a committee want to pick three or five we don't want to go crazy it's our first year and we want to just pick a few things that we think yeah. are going to be impactful yeah so right. uh, and if i may um, just say that as you look through um, you know the list of goals that has been compiled most of them are coming from some of the conversations we had during self-assessment um, but also some of the conversations we have had in general in the school committee meetings and also looking at what Dr. Kavanaugh has proposed as some of the goals. And I just want to uh, add to what Amanda talked about, the three to five goals. The rest of the goals we can choose to pick up in upcoming years, the future committees could look at that. Um, we could look to revise them, we could add them. So it's just a first cut of what the two of us thought is worth bringing forth for consideration. And, and I think like in the same way that Dr. Kavanaugh shared her goals, that is not the set, the only set of things that will be worked on this year. I mean, there's a whole job of running the district. Those are sort of the priority areas on top of that full job of being the superintendent. So I think we were thinking of the three to five goals I said sort of discretionary, and it's a discretionary focus. It sits on top of our job to approve the budget, um, you know, manage the policies, and, and oversee the superintendent. So I don't know, but I think when we get specific, we can tease it out. I don't know if HCAM could bring up the um, slides that were sent today with the specific list. That it is in there. Oh, yeah, they definitely they have, have that, that one that, because. Yeah. We went through the order when I got here today. Yeah, it's it. Yeah. Oh, it's in there now. Should be. Okay. Looks like it's the next slide. Oh yeah, I think if you click, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna get to it. Down. There you go. Okay, so what you see here, I mean, I'll just set the, up the discussion of how the chart is structured, and then you can maybe take it from there. But what what we did, there are color coded bands that match the color coding on the strategic priorities from. Dr. Kavanaugh. So there were a couple that we came up with in the first band that was the band for plan for enrollment growth. Then there were a few, that, a couple that we came up with around valuing individual pathways and wellness, which was another district priority. Jen, if you could just advance it. Sure. Sorry. Um, there were a set that we came up with under build school communities of collaboration and communications and stakeholder partnerships. And, and then a few under diversity. So it was sort of both the three columns and the two um, priority areas that cross cut the strategic priorities. We, we tried to think in terms of those buckets and then within a bucket, what would be something that the school committee could do to support that effort? And that's um, that combined with um, things that came out of our self-assessment and have just been articulated preferences. You know, I think Nancy started the work last year about being more transparent and so forth, sort of all that bubbled together to come up with this starting point. Um, so if we could go back to the first slide, could we go in reverse too? We, we all do. <laughs> We're super powerful. In theory, you can go in reverse. Okay. So Mina, did you want to speak to uh, take one of the goals that we came up with as an example. Sure, I, I can do that. And, uh, you know, uh, there were also those other protocols that we looked at in coming up with what you see is the verbiage here. Um, so the one that uh, I want to talk about is perhaps uh, goal number four, school committee roles and responsibilities. I think this is something we had heard during the assessment uh, that we want to improve the school committee efficiency and respect member time commitment uh, by streamlining roles and responsibilities across subcommittees, liaison roles, working groups, etc. So, you know, we can refine this further, but this is something that clearly came out of our conversation where we said, uh, you know, how can we uh, streamline this work? Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a good one. I think your list, I um, 
you know, you emailed, emailed it out yesterday, and I think that you guys obviously put a huge amount of thought in it, and I like that we're thinking about the strategic plan as you're thinking about school committee goals, too. Um, but I think we also, you know, at, as you sort of alluded to in the beginning, we need to make sure that we stick to things that fall under our Correct. umbrella, our purview. And so, by all means, Mina, you know, the one you're bringing up right now, I think definitely is something that we could find a way to streamline and improve. Yep. Um, and then a lot of the green ones, I think, are also um, things that the school committee could have a handle in. Um, you know, even standardizing reporting, I think maybe the title of it gives a slightly different, um, sends a slightly different vibe than the way I'm interpreting it, but I think that it's been great. A number of the administrators have made the reports that they bring to the school committee much more digestible, more easily um, understood. And so I think, you know, if the five of us understand it a little bit more easily, for sure, the, the community at large is going to have an easier time understanding. If we can't understand it, you know, how are folks who might not have their hand in the school going to be able to understand it? Um, you know, things at the beginning, I don't know that we should necessarily, I mean, for sure we, we can be made aware of and, and voice our opinions on, but I don't know that we should have that as a goal, long-range facilities planning. We need to be able to think about the fact that we're running out of room, and we need to be able to be, be aware of and knowledgeable about what's happening um, with district leadership to make that not become a, a long-range problem. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that we can necessarily take that on as a goal because it isn't something that we can specifically take action on. Um, as a committee, mm -hmm. and and same thing with the human resource plan and student metrics. Those are things that sort of aren't our. We we should be knowledgeable about those things, but I don't know that we can set up a goal to do anything about those things. Those are school administrator tasks. But I like the school committee responsibilities. I like the community communications. I like standardizing our practices and pr procedures for sure, and and collaborating with municipal. Um, legislators. So, I mean, I definitely like the second half of your list a lot. I think it makes a lot of sense to try to pick a couple of those to focus on for the year. I also think, uh, and I know you guys, you guys did a tremendous amount of work, so I just want to thank you guys both for this. No, but ton of time. I echo some of your thoughts on, in, I, in terms of respecting the member time commitment, that contradicts in some ways some of the ones that are taking on things that are more traditionally or not under our purview, that goals one, two, and three, and seven to a, a certain extent, feel like an overreach into the superintendent and the admin team's roles. And I feel like, not just in terms of, like, I agree, I think we need to be knowledgeable, but I feel like if we take those on as goals, I think that can be dangerous to it in, in a certain way in the message that it's sending to our admin team in that I feel like if we were a low performing district or a district where we had significant concerns about our admin team, I think that would be a, a place where we would maybe want to step a little bit further. But I feel like we just went through the school improvement plans and one of the things that I know I wasn't the only one who had said, but one of the strengths is the longevity we've had with and the stability we've had within the team. Mm -hmm. And I worry if we give the message that we need, to, essentially that we feel like we need to take these on as ours instead of letting them take the lead on it, I worry the message is, is that we think there's a deficiency there, that we think that there is, that we think that we can do it better. I don't think that was the intent at all. I think it was yeah. how can we support the effort. Like, right. like yeah. how can we, and I, and I would not want to send that message at all, but I think, just to be clear, like things like the budgeting, um, is there anything that we can do to help explain to the community where we are? Is there any role that we play? I mean, it is, in that it was a, it's a strategic priority plan for enrollment and growth, trying to think about what is it that we should be doing in our role as a liaison or, you know, Whatever, what is it that we can do, if anything? And maybe there's yeah. nothing. And again, we're only going to pick three of these. Like, this yeah. is, but that's yeah. just to explain. It's just there's no misunderstanding. The genesis of it was more. What is it that we can do to help? 
to make sure that we continue to have the success of last year's budget cycle, where I think the community felt very confident mm -hmm. in Dr. Kavanaugh's presentation, the due diligence, and all that. I think is what else? What what can we do? And what should we be? You know, I think we're already doing this, but again, right. um, it's in some sometimes when you look at, at goals, both the school improvement plan and Dr. Kavanaugh's and these. Some of the things we already do, but it's yeah. it's explain it's making sure people know that we do them. Let's we do it already, so let's explain that this is something that we're doing and this is how we're doing it. And um, it's not to criticize what is being done. That wasn't the intent. So right. So um, you know, I just want to uh, reiterate some of the things that Amanda spoke to, and I just want to add a little bit too. Um, so there is. Obviously, a lot of the administrative operational aspects, not a lot, all the operational aspects are under Dr. Kavanaugh's purview. And to what uh, both uh, Nancy Yu as well as Jen spoke to, um, the second half is clear, a lot of it is under our action, right? Mm -hmm. So we are responsible for it, we are accountable for it. We may rely on support in certain instances with Dr. Kavanaugh or her team in even doing those. For instance, we might need Georgette's help um, in some of those instances or get some you know, back and forth with Dr. Kavanaugh in some of those aspects. But in these other areas, that responsibility rests with Dr. Kavanaugh. However, we absolutely do support, right? All of our work that we are doing when we are asking and are talking about the growth and the numbers around it, all the planning, we're all going to be spending a lot of time looking at the results of the capacity study, for instance, uh, you know, uh, reviewing all of that in detail. So just trying to focus, you know, what was very clear in the messaging today to me when I heard the principles was we want to focus on the facilities right this year and they want to say that even though we may have all of these uh, you know be able to get the teachers and paraprofessionals and whatnot we have these dark you know we don't have rooms with open windows in certain cases so that's what they are talking about so how is it that we can support that and our purview might be you know participating in public forums or you know, as, as things come up and we sit through um, office hours, being able to explain, making sure we understand what the work, what is the work that we're doing. So the key word there, as Amanda also pointed out, is support. Mm -hmm. So Right, if, if that makes sense. And again, this is a first cut. Yep. Uh, I think, the, uh, you know, we had uh, discussed similar things, that what is under our purview, what is with Dr. Kavanaugh, and when we talk, for instance, about standardizing reports, that's not something we can sit and do on our own at all. So for instance, if we want to consume data in a certain way, so that as Jen said, um, the community can understand, we can understand, then we need to be able to speak to what is it that we want to look at. And then um, Dr. Kavanaugh and her team uh, you know, looking at what may be possible for them. We talked about possibly three to five reports there. Then they can also look to see what what is possible and what is not possible. So that will be a joint effort again. And it has to be a priority on, on both sides. So again, these are initial thoughts. Um, obviously, uh, there there is uh, some uh, seeming overlap. So but, I, I, but I would like all of us to think about what are the um, top three or five items that come to mind and what is it that we could work on to kind of improve and work on and um, look at those goals and um, adjust them further as well. And are there others yep. that you want to add? Sorry, Nancy, go ahead, please. No, so I guess I was kind of taking it from the reverse, which is that I really, I specifically don't want to consider one, two, and three, because I feel like that is, I feel like we want to support them, but I don't think I want to see those as our goals. I want to see our goals be more squarely in what's our purview mm -hmm. and right. not feeling concerned that we're overreaching into what, and I don't want to speak for how it would feel to, 
I, I think we need to partner and support, but not take that as take their focus as ours, if that makes sense. And I think we. I think there are a million goals to pick yeah. from. I think yeah. starting with three is fine. I, I just I want to make I just want to say again that they, in, there is no um, intent. Oh, I know. To cast any judgment on, on anything. This is really so even the long range planning. I can tell you, we were sitting in the website subcommittee meeting and talking about what do we put on the district site about this, the district profile. One of the things that some of the parents said is that we really wish we could know, we know we're investing in growth capacity. We know we're building things. What, are, what happened to those capital projects we approved? What's, are those things happening? Like They wanted status. They wanted more, more communication, um, which it's, it's an example of something that, I mean, does Susan need to do you know, Send out no. I think you have more than enough things to do. But is there a way that we could maybe help, you know, share what's happening or um, just bring people on board, be more transparent? So it was not to take anyone's responsibilities. It was to support and endorse what's already being done. I don't. I don't yeah. want to just come yeah. across as saying. I don't think that you were saying that intentionally at all. Right. I, I'm looking at kind of what it feels like. I think. For us. Like yeah. I think the intention is absolutely great because we want to be excited, we want to be supportive of what's going on. I just want to make sure that the optics of what we're choosing in the end yep. are, are conveying the message that we want to convey. If that makes yeah, sense. Fair enough. Yeah. So I really did like uh, looking at um, improving school committee efficiency and looking at it. I had also thought if it's okay to jump in with looking at um, efficiency and effectiveness, um, I, looking at standardizing, we we're talking about the policies and not policies, the practices, Practices, thank you, um, and looking at just kind of best practices and uh, Mina and I had, had discussed some of that work um, that we haven't quite had a chance to get to um, just in terms of our conversations this summer. That, that one's a lot, number six is a lot around um, building institutional knowledge for school committee. So as yeah. we roll on and off, yeah, um, having, you know, not that we don't do things well, but having it at least documented so the new people can I, pick up and keep it running more seamlessly without having to have all that institutional knowledge, you know, in someone's head. I love that, uh, and I think it will help, like you said, with people rolling on and off and kind of, I would envision it could be kind of a living type of document where we may find that things shift over time and we add and, yeah. and excuse me, re, you know, revisit at different yeah. points. Nancy, is there anything else that uh, you think should be uh, anything, you know, even broadly that we could add? Uh, one one thought that we both, uh, both uh, Amanda and I, uh, talked about a little bit around communication is also around social media, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, a lot of folks um, access information very differently than in the past. And um, right now, I know last year there was an attempt to try a school committee blog or a newsletter, mm -hmm. and um, we you know, were not able to do it because of the way we function and whatnot. Uh, but perhaps looking to see how can we meet our um, community where they are mm -hmm. at and what they're comfortable with. And at the same time, not taking on what we're not, um, you know, uh, what's not our role, if you will, right? right. If someone's asking for some information um, on, on, you know, where can I find this full information, right? Where should that question go? Right. So, so some questions around perhaps our social media presence and how can we work on that and at least start thinking about it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, I, you know, in the past, I personally have loved how eHop, when they do know your vote, yeah. they're able to use Facebook and get some questions with that. And I know with us being, a, a, you know, a, we are a, a body of members who are bound by so many uh, regulations, I don't know how much we are able to do um, in terms of um, social media, communication, improving some of that. Uh, but I think that's another area worth exploring. Um, it's something 
that was on our minds. And I was wondering, you know, if there are other things uh, if you have that you would want to add broadly, so, a broad category. In terms of, I, I do have a few thoughts, improving school committee efficiency and effectiveness. I really mm -hmm. like the idea of taking a 360 degree view at ourselves and what we're doing to help inform our best practices in ways that we may need to, you know, either make improvements or kind of do more of different areas. And I like, I, we have discussed this at, at different points in the past, but the thought of taking uh, feedback from both the community and from the administrative team just mm -hmm. as two different, I, I don't know the best vehicle, whether it be a survey or some way of getting mm -hmm. feedback that we could then kind of incorporate and look and say, okay, this is something we're doing really well. And this is something that maybe we're not hitting the mark of where we'd hope to be doing. Could I add something? That's a great in? thought. Okay. One thing I was just thinking about in terms of communication, and it is so important that we communicate yeah. with our families. I also think about the pressure on schools to communicate out with families, and now every school has um, a Twitter and Instagram, yeah. so we're in, plus athletics has that. And I think that I heard Carol say in her goal something about sharing out some kind of a superintendent report with families a certain number of times a year. So one thing that, and now I'm seeing that some of the school committee meeting um, agendas are being sent out through email. So sometimes we kind of face the, that challenge of communicating too much. So I don't know if that's something that the school committee could actually take off your plate in terms of communicating information. So some of the things you're talking about, what's the work on facilities, where are we going with our capital information, that may be information that is best received by the community directly from the superintendent. And I might see school committee where you have your office hours, mm -hmm. you're taking in information, you're hopefully sharing that back with district administration. So I feel like this is such an overachieving, that I might be overstepping your school yeah. committee and you wanna do so many things. But I think some of that feeding out information might not be necessary at all times. So mm -hmm. if you're coming up to budget season, and let's say we're lucky enough to have a vote on and Elmwood SOI, like that's huge. That's gonna be game time for the school committee to get on board and start promoting that information. But some of, I think we just also wanna be careful about not you all feeling like you have to share too much out mm -hmm. because some of it may end up being redundant with what the superintendent or schools are already doing mm -hmm. and it's just an added pressure from your perspectives too, I, I don't know. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Okay, I, I think we have some feedback here, right, Amanda? Uh, perhaps we can uh, take this back and bring back some other thoughts, and if there are other specific areas that come to mind, Jen or uh, Nancy? One other thought, um, and this maybe it's a very short-term thing, but um, in, in terms of collaborate, I guess promoting communication and transparency, but would be, engaging in collaborative communication and work with other town boards, not attending the committee meetings, I know it's on there as appropriate for our work, but and also increasing collaborations with the other boards and committees as appropriate, uh, and also working with the town to support a budget that serves the enrollment growth that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. That's, I know, going to be upon us very soon, but... Sure. Different ways so would you say elab elaborate a little bit more on number eight? So I have to, I'm that flipping between different things. So, so yes, yeah, so that, that's right, just exactly. Because I do really like that. Mm -hmm. yes. Right, when I, every time I flip back and forth, I end up with a font that is so small. Yeah, I think if you're eliminating yeah. number one, you'd pick up some pieces of that in number eight, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Working with the planning board, yeah. working with the board of selectmen. And you know, I would encourage you to think too, outside of, I mean, you know, we tried to come up with a place to start, yeah. but it is very difficult to figure out the right, um, param the right parameters and the boundaries. And how yeah. do you be supportive and not do, and not, you know, it, it is difficult. So I think, um, you know, one thing that didn't appear in here um, that we talked about too was doing a mid-year assessment of our own performance. I love that. Which. 
I think, again, I think we're going to do it anyway. Um, it might be, yeah. it, it's one of our goals to be more um, effective and more transparent. So maybe yeah. maybe that should have been made the list. Maybe there are others. So I'd say think about it because we we don't want too many. We don't want to, right. be, we don't want to go I, crazy, but we do want to figure out if there's anything, you know, that we want to chew on for this year. Yeah. And I think some of this may or may not inform our discussion around how many subcommittees do we actually have to have and what do they look like? You know, different districts do yeah. different things that way. Um, some are just like two or three standing subcommittees and that's it. And, you know, this this is the beginning. It's the beginning yeah. of a conversation. Yeah. So I'd say, you know, think about what we missed, what other kind of low-hanging fruit is out there that we didn't think about. And um, again, we tried to start with the prompt of um, each strategic priority and what does that mean to school committee so it may be that in some of the areas particularly in, in the, like the pink ones you know we just kind of do our job and we don't need yeah. to take anything else on extra it may mean that in some of the like the green areas you know we can do a lot better in how we do our job and maybe we focus there so you know that's kind of where it started again it's sort of a conversation so I think um, the ideal would be to, to have us make this list show anything that's missing and then somehow come back next time or whenever we yeah. can fit it in the agenda and pick our top, each of us pick our top three or yeah. something. Yeah, and I, I like that way of kind of ranking it and narrowing it down that way because yeah. I, I think what Jen said is a, a great thing. I think in some ways we are overachieving that we get, we have great ideas and we want to move things forward and I think back to last year with wanting to do the blog and the newsletter, it, there was a lot of enthusiasm but it was more than what we could could right. do at that time. Yeah. So. We don't have a mechanism to create content. It's not in our it's right. It's not exactly. in our lives. Exactly. So, right. Uh, but I, I appreciate moving forward and if from the conversation of you know the MASC conference last year and, and why don't we have goals and kind of being able to move forward and figuring out what goals make the most sense to us. It's a, a definitely step forward. So thank you to both of you. Um, um, Amanda did a tremendous amount of work here. Um, she really uh, took this um, on, upon herself and she was able to draft and craft a lot of this with all the words and whatnot. Um, thank you so much, Amanda. It's a joint effort. I can see your analytical mind at work in there. Yeah. You do good presentations. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's, it's hard to start somewhere and I think it was nice to look at the um, some of the samples that we got from uh, Ms. Parsons and, and looking at other districts, but it is hard to figure out where we start on our own, especially as we are also starting a strategic plan and so forth. So um, just I'm, I'm thankful that you take it in the spirit it was offered, and I hope that yeah. the administration does not feel that this set of brainstorm goals was in any way a, a, a statement about anything other than how can we help. So. Okay, so I have um separate issue which some kind of people pulling my packet back Hold up. On, I have it it's in here. Somewhere. Here it is. Wait a sec, right here at the bottom. So Nancy, I'm also yes. looking at the time here. We are running short on time. What what is your preference for where we go here, Mina? Um, I would like us to do the calendar because I think uh, we need to take a vote at least on our or kind of come to an agreement at least on our regular meetings. Okay. Right. The rest of the events and whatnot can wait. Okay. So let's. Is let's, that okay? With I, the, I, I think that's totally a great, fine. great idea. Uh, and you're right. We are um, running a little over here. So the I am looking at the calendar here. The it looks like the November has been the November 28th got taken out. That's Thanksgiving. But right. did we talk Which about the good. 21st? Do, well, I was just going to ask that because the seventh is the MASC MASS conference. Right. I thought we'd spoken about taking Halloween out and adding a meeting on the 21st of November instead of on the 31st oh, right. of, of October. I think probably taking Halloween out um, would be preferable Definitely to those it. of us with I mean, I'm going to throw it out there that I probably won't be here that night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to throw um, it out So in do the, do the 21st, you're saying, instead? If we, yeah, if we need that meeting, absolutely. Throw, I, I would say, you know, November's always having anyway. That's the way it goes. Is that okay, um, okay with you guys? Fine with me. Sure. All right, so 
Thanksgiving is the 28th, right? Thanksgiving is the 28th. Okay. And maybe we'll just be thankful to be not sitting here on Thanksgiving. <laughs> so scratch the 31st of October. Add in the 21st. And then we also were talking a few minutes ago, or now many minutes ago, about the December meeting. Getting rid um, so of the just so I'm clear, uh, we are saying add which day? So talk 20, about getting rid of October, the 31st, right, and add and in add November 21st. November 21st? Right. Which actually is the third Thursday, so it would have been, yeah. if not for the MASC conference, right, it right. would have been a regular meeting right. anyway. Okay. Is that okay? So we are, yeah, so we're still targeting two for November. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. that... Okay. And then December, we had talked, when we were talking about the budget timeline, we had talked about getting rid of the 19th and putting one in on the 12th instead. Yeah. Yep. That makes good sense. All right. So I'm making those changes as, we, as we're discussing. All right. So... And January 2nd comes a regular meeting for us, but no vote, no budget hearing. Right. right. But right. the 9th is the budget hearing now? Right. And 16th is the vote. Yes. The vote. Yeah. Yep. So 2nd, 9th, and 16th remain. Okay. okay. Just like a regular party here. And is it okay that we wait? We, we miss both the 23rd and the 30th? That seems like a, in That's the a middle good point. of the budget That's season, large. that seems like a big... Um, Jump. Well, although we will we'll be voting the budget. Are you talking about January? January yes, we'll right. vote the budget on the 16th. So the budget season for us is sort of on hold for a <laughs> yeah. little bit. Uh, but it is a larger gap because it's... Is that what we did this past year? Do you remember? I think we did. Do we? Okay. We had a couple gaps in there, yeah. Mm -hmm. January is such a long month. Why is the 9th in red? I was wondering that, that myself. Okay. That was going to be the public hearing for the budget. Oh, okay. Or okay, is it ready so for executive session? Oh, I see. So it does say it at the bottom. Yeah. It does? At the bottom of the gym. Yeah. Oh, January. yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and do we know, um, are, are we planning specifically to have executive sessions there, or are we just thinking that's about when we need them? Um, it looks like, I mean, we have had, uh, that's about when we need them. Okay. But so we don't know. We have know. typically had those around those dates. So maybe. So maybe we don't. It, depending on whether it. something arises, right. right? Is that. Right. As you do agenda planning. That's right. We can try to aim for those. Are there other things from the last iteration that okay, you want to. I don't think so. And Mina, are we we're looking to approve through the end of the year for this? I know last time we talked I, about. I, I guess uh, it's more an understanding, and that you know, at least for the blue items, we are all good. Yeah, right. So that way, everyone can put these on their calendars, and then the rest of the items we will work through. Right. Right. So, for instance, the May fourth and fifth are our town meeting dates. Who knows it might get extended by another day right mm -hmm. so this is to the extent that we know um, and also all the regular meetings we want to make sure that we have all of those covered mm -hmm. uh, again Georgette had looked at uh, a lot of this and kind of cleaned up any um, uh, anything falling with the um, holiday schedule and whatnot so she had confirmed some of that as well Last year, I think we were invited to the school kickoff meeting that you had with that's the correct. teachers. I don't yes. know if that's something that happens every year. I don't see it on here. It may not be, but you're definitely invited Did you, to it. Yeah. When is that? It's usually the day before know. school starts, right? It would be. It's, the, it's definitely that week. I wasn't sure if it was Monday or Tuesday. It's Monday. Okay, so yes. that would be the 26th? Correct, yep. Okay. So we're talking about 26th of August? Yes. Yeah, and it's like in the morning. It's a breakfast. It's morning, right? Like eight. To yes, eight o'clock. Yep. All right. Um, 
So again, in terms of the blue dates, I'll be good to go. So I just want to quickly go over those. Um, September, we have the 5th and 19th. October, we have the 3rd and the 17th. We're walking rid of the 31st. November, we have the 14th. We're not doing the 7th because of the MAC conference. Instead of that, we are adding the, um, you know, we're having 14th and 21st in November. In December, we're doing 5th and the 12th. We are not doing uh, a meeting on the 19th at the moment. Mm -hmm. In January, we have the 2nd, 9th, and 16th. February, the 6th and the 27th. March, the 12th and the 26th. April, the 9th and the 30th. May, 4th, 5th, and the 14th. And June, uh, 4th and the 18th. Good. That looks good. Mm -hmm. I like that we're okay. looking at summer for next year already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, that sounds good in terms of all the regular meetings. In terms of all the events and whatnot you're planning, um, most of the invites uh, in terms of the school were things, again, uh, Georgia very kindly looked at. You can see some of the items around the pops concerts for the down in the year, um, you know, uh, different aspects that she has been able to put together. But I think there's still more work to be done in terms of uh, what all are the events that we want to go to? Um, how many office hours do we want in the year? Do we do it on a monthly basis or not? These are aspects we still have to work through. I Mina, mean, have we locked it on um, Visions training yet? We don't have a date yet. Okay. We do have coming up on this Monday the ice cream social with the new district, new members, new kids coming into the district. Just as a... I think as long as we have our meeting dates, though, sort yeah. of set in stone, the other events, um, yeah. you know, as they come, that, I think that folks want to know when the school committee meetings are going to be. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. at least at least a few of them. Are. A lot of people want yeah, to Yeah, exactly. That. Right. Yeah. And so the 19th is kind of listed out, as you can see, the Youth Commission one. Yeah. So yes. if I think yes. that's there's what, a, that's what made me think of it. ultimately we want to be able to publish this. And I think if we standardize it once and say, OK, these are the ones we are absolutely going to do. For instance, uh, Amanda just talked about the kickoff. That was certainly mm -hmm. not on my radar. Uh, but something to be added and perhaps something that we do every year. Mm -hmm. Right. And like I said, uh, I did run uh, all those aspects that we talked about that we want to be able to go to all the events um, that respect different um, learners, different interests, as well as all the five schools, right? Mm -hmm. So I did share that, and based on that is how I um, received the information back from Georgia. Uh, but we can continue to finalize that. Um, all the other events, et cetera, that we want to be able to do. And certainly want to work on the office hours for next month. Yes. Great. So perhaps something that is something we can do offline and put it on the calendar. Sure. Great. Thank you. All right. So then are we um, going to move or I into, do we have want to move into future agenda items? Does anyone have anything they want to throw out for that? Right, so I guess we're holding off on the norms as well, correct? The norms oh, yes, sorry. I, I, I was thinking yes, but if anybody wanted to jump into it, I, I have to go shortly because I have to pick up. I could maybe do that. I'm, I'm absolutely fine with that. I um, just want to check with everyone else as well. Yeah, and for whatever it's worth, we wrote them as a committee last year. Yeah, I don't right. feel like we need to tweak them. So I would be, if you like them as is, I would be willing to vote them as is since the five of us wrote them. <laughs> but I, if you want to hold it off until the next time. I would be okay with that as well. I don't know. Although, Mina, do you have thoughts on that? Um, I am okay as well. At the same time, I want to give, um, you know, since it was on the agenda, give Meg an opportunity yep. to be here as well. Okay. Uh, I, I don't yep. know what That's she thinks. I have no idea. Good point. All right. Um, so so right. why don't we do that, Nancy, and also in the interest of time, move forward. I like that idea. Uh, any future agenda items then? None at this time. Okay. Well, then let's move into items by consensus. Okay. 
scoot all the way back to my agenda at the beginning of the book. I should know this line by heart. <laughs> As superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote to approve the items by consensus as outlined in the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. And I guess we'll do a roll call. Aye. Mina? Aye. Okay. Yes. I am also a yes. Um, and that passes and that moves us into adjournment. I have a motion to adjourn. Second. And we'll do a roll call there. Aye. <laughs> Mina? Aye. Yes. I am also a yes, and we are adjourned at 2.21 p.m. Our next meeting is on September 5th. It's a regular meeting at 7 p.m. with the location to be determined. Thank you all, and enjoy the rest of the summer.